the first item on the agenda is general public comment. Now we do have a public comment scheduled later in the evening, um, but if you chose to, if you can find if you want to make the public comment about one of the applications, or if you have a public comment session that's scheduled for the five years in question. In that case, there is um, well, the chair's report. Let's see, we have the the dues. Yes. So we have to vote. We have to vote on our agenda. So um, the dues have come due again from the Community Preservation Coalition. So lacking a the record. There four thousand and three fifty. Yeah. Is that a bump? Is that more so? I believe it is. They have a formula that they use, but I think they changed it a little bit. So, um, lacking a vote, I will, or lacking a vote being on our agenda, we'll move on now to the update on the Housing Supportive Services Project, which was recommended and funded by Council to the Project. Hey everybody, um, my name is Gordon, Gordon Shaw, and I'm the chair of the Northampton Housing Partnership. I've uh, been a member of the partnership for about eight years now. Um, and I'm here to report to update you on the selection of our vendor uh, for this project. Um, and I just want to first thank you for, uh, for funding this project. Um, I'm an attorney in legal aid and I, um, and I work uh, a lot with the population that this project is going to be supporting um, tenants in particular. Uh, tenants. I do a lot of housing prevention, uh, eviction prevention work. And I really feel like this this piece, this this project is going to fill a gap in what what's missing in terms of our ability to help preserve housing for people that we who we are calling living in community housing. Um, there's only so much that the law can bring to the process. Uh, so often the uh, issues that are involved in, in why people end up losing their homes uh, really deal with social socioeconomic factors that are going on in their lives. And this is a this is a. So, a project that's going to bring a support first and leads to a mix that's going to help stabilize tendencies here in North Miami. So anyway, we had um, we had a, an RFP process that just completed this past uh, January. Um, we had three applicants, we, uh, three strong applicants, uh, Center for Human Development, Community Action, um, and uh, Casa Latina. Um, we ended up selecting Center for Human Development, and the thing that pushed us with, to go with that program was their, their sort of uh, uh, institutional, uh, their, the size of the program and the ability to provide other support to the types of things that our, we knew our, our, our target population was going to be experiencing. Um, so we just uh, notified them uh, just last week that they were our selection, um, and you had asked it as part of the funding that we notify you as to who we selected. So I've notified you that the Senate will be in development and we expect the work to begin. What I passed around is the uh, uh, matrix of performance measurements. This is something that you asked for. Um, and this is setting out um, what we expect to achieve on an annual basis for the funding that you've given us. Well, I missed the uh, Casa Latina and the one you selected. Who was the third applicant? Community Action. And has the Center for Human Development identified a person? No, they're they're going to do a uh, focused hiring for this position. Hire are they? Scheduled by when? Uh, the uh, within the first three months they need to fill the position of getting the getting the, uh, the grant. And it's a three. It is a three year grant. Other questions? What, what is a represented a service? Um, oh, that is a. Uh, if you're familiar with Social Security, so Social Security has a has a has a uh, 
process whereby someone who's not able to manage their money, someone is appointed to be the recipient to actually receive their social security benefits or SSI benefits. And if they then manage their money, pay their bills for them. Um, for example, pay their rent. And we've identified that as one of the things that we would want to see the, uh, uh, the vendor provide that type of service, be able to arrange those services for tenants that would need that type of assistance. <coughs> And actually, uh, one of the things that why Center for Human Development uh, stood out among the applicants is because they already have a rep payee program in place, so we would just be able to build on to that. And yeah. As soon as there's a person, I'd like to make sure that um, to, to offer them a tour of the Survival Center. The, I've spoken with the Survival Center about this position being sure. staffed, and it seems to me to be symbiotic that the two would know of each other's work. Yes, I mean, the, the, the right app, the right candidate for this job is going to be someone that knows all of the resources here in Northampton and Survival Center. Other questions? Did our <coughs> contract to make the Concluding to this, or we would agree to the performance measure or providing this as a courtesy or Sarah? So it was required that this be presented and that the rationale for choosing the selected agency be brought to the CPC, but uh, the committee didn't refuse to No, no, i about the performance measure. No, for either one. Can you explain uh, number two on your measurement matrix what the eviction risk assessment? and how that measures the success. <coughs> uh, right, risk assessment is, is basically when you interview your, your tenant, you do a series of questions checking in on different things that could play into what might um, be a uh, trigger for causing their inability to comply with their lease behavior. Like so they do an assessment. It's a tool that CHD is, 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 is going to roll out to work with this, this tenant population. Okay, and then the <coughs> intervention action plan. Because I'm wondering how that measures your success. I can see that measures your the, the, the family that may be coming in and what their situation is at the time. But how do you? measure over those three years whether they've had any issues with subsequent evictions. Well the, the what we envision happening and I you know these are sort of technical terms and then we're 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 borrowing from what how CH defines how they do their work. But let me just explain what the what the vision is for the worker. The worker is going to be somebody who um, uh, first of all people who have active eviction cases. They're going to make themselves available and help to stabilize um, uh, the factors that are leading to why maybe they're not paying their rent. I know when I go to court and I represent tenants, we end up making a lot of agreements. And those agreements um, stay open as a court case for many months, maybe even a year. And in that, there's a plan to help stabilize them. My work is done, but oftentimes the tenant is not able to carry through on the issues. And then they're back in court six months later on a motion because they didn't comply. So the idea is that this worker is going to be able to ensure that they're meeting the, the, the terms of that agreement. We also want the work, this worker to do early intervention as well. So part of what the job is going to be is reaching out to um, subsidized properties here in Northampton within the Housing Authority, making, making the managers of those projects aware of the services that are available so early, event, in early intervention can happen so they end up not even having to file that eviction case. But it's a both, it's so they, they will have tools and they'll do intakes and they'll do assessments and they'll figure out what are the services or what are the things that we can, they can bring to help stabilize that situation. And these, that's just the technical language they use to describe the tools that they have that they're going to use to do this. Yeah. No, I'm, and I get that. And I think that's one of the reasons why we voted so favorably on this project. So we want to see that happen. I guess my concern would be, and this is the first time we're seeing it, so we can digest it. Maybe any other further comments is that 
part of this was going to be a demonstration project so that in the subsequent years you could go to other funders, mm -hmm. replicate it, increase the program. And so my concern would be not only to be able to assess the tools and that people have received the services, but to be able to demonstrate that the services were effective. Are you actually able to show that the number of evictions have gone down or that the people who are in this process who avail themselves of these tools no longer encounter them? Right. Well, I'm, I would look to then what the outcome is in the annualized target column. That we, what we're proje projecting is that, that 30 households will have to serve the, the services provided will have stabilized, i.e., prevented them from having to move out of what we call community housing. Right. Yeah. And that's what I'm asking is what is the actual mechanism to track them? Because under tracking method, you have the eviction risk assessment and the plan. So that's what I'm, I'm lying in the connection there. For me, it, 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 the end result will be um, they're no longer at risk of losing their home. Even the eviction case got dismissed, the eviction case never got filed. They, they may have received a notice to quit saying you're, we're going to proceed with evicting you unless you, you correct something. Pay your rent. Dave, I think that's that the indicators over year over year. That, that's how I would look at how they're doing. Is you know the first year they did these indicators, and the second year it got better, and the second you know third year it got better, which is I think what would be great for grant money. Yeah, I mean, my vision of the work is they're going to stay engaged with this family or household for um, for, for a considerable period of time to have make sure things are staying stable. As a, as a lawyer on the case, my work ends when I file that agreement and then I've got it and they come back to me with the problem. And this is something that's going to stick with them for any on court case. And I think to Devin's point, you, <coughs> if it is successful, you want to be able to show that it's successful from year to year or not, that it just saved up that one addition notice that they received the services to enable them to manage their budget so that they don't encounter the problem again. And if you can show that, then you can market it. So that would be the pitch. Maybe it doesn't fall perfectly within this matrix, but I think that would be the ultimate objective. I know what I'm saying. I mean, I, I can bring that back to CHD and, and work with them and figure out how we can, how we can make sure that that is tracked. <coughs> and Danny, I just pulled up the MOU for this, and the selection criteria and the matrix were spelled out separately, so the community does have to show for this. <coughs> This is not the selection. No, the, the selection was just a report to the committee, but the annual reporting matrix needed to be approved. So, um, right, because I think in our, I think the reason that we did the, the reporting matrix is that was more important to us or as important as going forward since the, the data from mm -hmm. you know, how the data is collected will be important in terms of how useful it is and when it comes, you know, if it comes back to this community for additional funding. Um, so I guess my sense would be do we want to, since that vote is not on our schedule, mm -hmm. that we should look at this, um, maybe get written comments or additional questions to Mr. Shaw, get those responses, and then at our next meeting we can put it on the agenda and approve it at that point. Yeah, and this wouldn't have to be filed until December. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Additional questions? If I can just amplify it, that I, I think maybe if, if you were to focus on your 30 households stabilized, it's, that's an unclear what that term. Means. Yeah. You know, are you, look, are you talking about stability of nine months, 12 months, or something? So if we could have some sense, additionally, of a, of a time frame, um, that could really help. I know that tracking households over a long period of time can be difficult, but I do think we need some some sense of the longevity that's mm -hmm. uh, that's intended here. Um, and I'm assuming that that, that we will know how many um, asked for assistance and of those how many were successful and how many were not. Mm -hmm. In other words, how many action takes were done. How many things were done and how many had what you would call a successful conclusion of the, the household being stabilized or neglected? So 
my understanding is you, you were going to take the opportunity to submit additional written questions and respond to that. Yes, I, I, I believe since, the, since we're just seeing this for the first time, um, sure. that, that the committee would basically send our questions to Sarah and that she would bring them together in a document and we basically right. send it to you and okay. provide us with any responses and any particular experience. Thank you. Well, thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next item on the agenda is the meeting with the applicants for round one of 2015. The first scheduled is the rehabilitation of the Union Street Jail building. And this applicant is the Cooler Park Condo Association. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, Sarah asked me to point out that the uh, Historical Commission has deemed us eligible. Um, my name is Lucia Miller and I am a homeowner at the Old Jail um, for the last eight years. Been in town about 18 years and there are a bunch of us here tonight in support of this application. So um, I understand that you all have re already reviewed the application so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, stop me if I'm talking too much. Um, this is a 163-year-old building that was deeded to us in about 1985 when Hampshire County sent out an RFP for reuse and development when they were moving the jail out to Rocky Hill Road. We met the county, city, and neighborhood objectives at that time. These were objectives spelled out that um, focused on preserving the structure and architectural features um, that, that maintain a use compatible with adjacent land uses, um, provided for neighborhood stability, low density, and was beneficial in terms of social and its economic return to the community. Um, and we feel we have um, upheld that over the years. Um, in September of 2014, um, we learned that our granite staircases, which are both on the front, which is the Union Street side and the back, um, you know, extending up on, on both sides, iconic architectural features um, were structurally unstable. Um, the, the granite pieces are built on um, supports on the sides that are bricks and bowing and deteriorating underneath. Um, we engaged the help of Ron Alex with Boston Bay Architects who is well known and highly regarded in this community for his work um, on the courthouse and also on the library. Um, and he told us we should close the stairs immediately, which we did. Um, and we've been working on um, the solution ever since, which um, is not that long for a group of volunteers. <laughs> um, so um, at this point, there are three phases to this project. Um, the first phase is the emergency temporary shoring. Um, this work is almost entirely complete, like any second now. Um, we do not know um, until it is complete and we have inspection whether we will be able to just use the stairs for emergency egress or if we will be able to actually use them on both sides again. Um, uh, and also for how long if we are able to use them and so what time frame we're actually on. Um, uh, our homeowners have already paid for all that. Uh, that was it's in your budget. Um, that's uh, thirty-three thousand. Although we just we came in under budget, so we're very happy about that. Um, something that's really important to note, though, is that our homeowners also, in the last five or so years, um, replaced the roof on the entire building um, to the tune of two hundred thousand dollars. So it's it's not as if we're just coming in here saying help. Um, we really have been um, stewarding the property uh, to the best of our ability since since it was turned over to us thirty years ago. Um, the second phase, stage two, is what this application is for, and that's for the rehabilitation and restoration of the steps. Um, and, and that's a big project. Um, it is important to know that we can look at that in stages, front and back, um, in separate, because they are uh, bid separately, and we just, again, don't know quite what our time constraints are at this point. Um, 
the third phase is something that we will move towards uh, once we have this taken care of, and that is developing a long-range master plan. We know we need that. We know we need that for our budgeting purposes. We also know we need that because we have an historical and architectural icon on our hands, and we all believe in its importance, not only as our home, but its place in the community. So um, that's where we are with all that. And I would love uh, to introduce Richard Groning, who has done a fabulous job of research uh, and writing on, on the application. And he also has put in an application to the Mass Historical Commission and can speak a little bit more to some of these um, important qualities. Good evening. Um, you've gotten, and it's, it's really good at that time reading the architectural description and the historical narrative. If it doesn't put you to sleep, I don't know what will. Uh, but basically, it it looks at the historical narrative looks at the place of the jail and the house correction in the community, both in its construction and then I've tried to trace it through, basically through the uh, local newspapers. Uh, community reaction, developments in the jail, uh, changes, improvements. And then I spent a lot of time looking at the process of planning for reuse in the planning department of Hampshire County. I think it's no longer an institution, but the planning department uh, uh, put the, the jail up for reuse bids and requested proposals and set, as Lucia explained, set a, a list of criteria that, that should be met. And important among those were uh, the significance and maintaining the uh, integrity of the site. Um, and here I should say that Bryant is a very important architect. He may not be well represented in western Massachusetts, but he certainly is well represented in eastern Massachusetts. And one of the quirky things about that is that they have drawings in the Boston Public Library and other places of eastern Massachusetts buildings and nothing for uh, uh, the jail. But this, this design is very similar to uh, the Charlestown Jail in, in Boston, which is now a Liberty Hotel, and also the uh, Norfolk County Jail in Dedham, which is now the Stonely uh, condominiums the distinctive three-story windows and the wings uh, one of the primary features. So it's, it's, it has an importance and significance uh, architecturally and also in terms of the history of prison reform because his um, collaborator, Louis Dwight, was very important in changes in attitudes towards the prison design and the running of prisons. And uh, I think in part the the great respect and even affection that people of Northampton have had for the jail. And you hear the accolades about Sheriff uh, Boyle in, in all the reports have to do with, with the, the wisdom of this kind of prison uh, design, uh, where the, the prisoners are not kept in solitary uh, confinement. They are not in a penitentiary, uh, which is the alternative. Significantly much derided by Charles Dickens when he visited the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia in the 1830s. So basically, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions about about the, the many facts of, uh, on this, uh, please ask me, or you know, I think you'll be able to find them in the uh, in the two documents. We also want to mention that we were remiss in looking at the criteria for the awards and we find that we do satisfy the open space criteria. Uh, zoning for public space in uh, uh, where we are requires 40 percent of the uh, of the site to be open space. Uh, that's from the planning uh, department's document. And the open space criterion uh, demands 30%, and I think we've met that. And in the future, we'll even be increasing the open space uh, with changes to the uh, parking lot. Um, so, you know, 
without going tediously through the uh, documents, if there are any questions uh, at this point. Did you want to mention your application to the Oh, well, yes, and, and part of this research was conducted for our application to the Massachusetts Historical Commission uh, to renew our status as eligible for the National Register. Uh, there was some sort of inventory taken in 1975 throughout the state, and we were, we were noticed then. But then there are 15 houses on Union Street, which are also in that inventory. And then in 1984, they went by, uh, went through again, and they called us eligible for the National National Register. Now, normally, if that had been done five or ten years ago, we wouldn't have to go through the process again. But because of the lapse of years, uh, they asked us to, to uh, refile. So we, uh, it's an even more elaborate uh, application than the uh, CPC. <laughs> so, and but but we're confident that we will be uh, that our eligibility will be uh, renewed. And what's the schedule that you expect for that? Uh, we're in the process of, of collating the last of the uh, forty or fifty attachments, and then we'll send that off. And we hope to hear fairly soon uh, from them. But it's hard to say. You know. uh, and then. If we were to apply for, if, you know, given that we're deemed eligible, uh, it's usually a two-year process to be placed on the National Register. But one of the one of the upsides of being called eligible is that then we would look, we could be looked more favorably upon by other funding sources. So that's really our one of our primary objectives. And then uh, one last thing is uh, Margaret Humbert Dross, who has some comments about some I think there was a question level of support. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I can ask it at the end. Right. I don't want to interfere with no, no, the presentation. I mean, Go ahead. Really, this is uh, it takes very little time. But we are look, we are seeking letters of support. I think we've already received some of them, uh, but I've, I've got some originals here, uh, including a petition. Uh, which is signed by uh, all the unit owners uh, who were present at our annual meeting on Monday. Now you may say, say, think that's self-serving. <laughs> on the other hand, the fact that the uh, so many uh, unit owners really want to maintain the building uh, properly and make sure that we have the, the steps in there back in the original shape, I think is, is indicative of uh, the kind of enthusiasm for, the, for this project. So I'm going to bring that here to you. And then we are, uh, everybody is going to be going out and seeking more letters of support. But in the meantime, this is what we've got. So I will give these to Mr. Mayor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and did you have a question? Um, yeah, I had a, a couple. When, when the uh, condominium was originally set up, was there, was there a replacement reserve funded at that time, or was it? Or, or not. I don't know who would be able to answer that question. So uh, no. no. Uh, I'm the property manager at this point, and looking back, uh, no one thought about it. It just was, in fact, no one's thought about it for a while. And we're sticking our heads into the oven here, kind of and looking around and see, well, where's the gas coming from and what's going to happen next? So we are actively. Uh, trying to address issues instead of uh, uh, being in a crisis mode. Uh, but at some point we have to get to that, you know, that's the tipping point. Uh, and the past hasn't helped us out with that. And it, it looks like now you're starting to fund annually a replacement yes. reserve. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we just upped it for the 2015 budget that we've just put into place. Uh, thanks for providing the financial information, though I was a little confused by it. Um, the roof will be paid off when? Uh, 2019, as of this month, or last month, I think it was 60000 in principal left. So it's as people buy uh, sell units or come into some, some uh, you know, found money, if that's ever happens, 
Uh, they've been buying out their share of the roof assessment. We've been putting that toward the principal. We could try and keep reamortizing the loan in order to bring the uh, you know the payments into a better line. Yeah, because it looked like it had been accelerated beyond right. what the original amortization yep. was. Yeah, some people were able to pay, pay off their portions through whatever means in advance of the, the full payout period. Um, and my last question is, um, I personally am uh, um, convinced about the um, historic merits of this project, the, the practicalities of the funding are, are on, on your side and on, on our side are, are another matter. Um, so I'm wondering if you could supplement once you do find out how long these temporary measures, because I think that will be Absolutely. important in our trying to figure out. Um, just, just to address that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the engineer that's you know, stamped the project uh, is insisting that he comes back once a year and checks the shoring and the structures that he uh, engineered and I think that's how our line's going to go and so if he comes back next year and it's all fine then you know, we go another year. If he comes back next year and goes hey, you got to do something here and here we might have to add a little more uh, and then you know get another year. So it depends on uh, but the, his judgment. The general ex there's an expectation that it might You'd be surprised if it lasted less than a year? Is that a fair uh, statement? I, no? I think we're looking, uh, you put me out on a limb here, kind of, but uh, uh, for five years, that. I would think we can get five out of this without uh, struggling. But correct me if I'm wrong, we don't know yet whether we'll be able to use it beyond the <coughs> at all. I understand. So we have not gotten quite that far. If we had another week, we might know. But in the meantime, we have an application deadline, so we talked about it. And uh, to talk about the reserve at, in 1984, there seemed to be no part of the request for proposal or the uh, outline of what the successful bidders had to do that required, and th there was no mention of it in any of the documents. No, I'm just trying to understand yeah. what the situation yeah. is and was. And trying to get the picture. Well, and also banks are responding a lot more differently now, too, because with refinancing or with buying, you know, getting a new mortgage, they're um, requiring that we have at least a 10%. Um, so, so I think, I don't know if that was in place prior or not, but with, you know, the last go around here in the economy, um, people are being a lot more cautious, and, and we know we need to do it, and, you know, it's, it's painful to everybody. But it's what we need to do because we otherwise don't have the funds we need. And Boston Bay architects have suspected that the deficiencies in the short, in the interior, the, the uh, stringers, uh, stringers, stringers uh, under the stairs probably had begun at the time of conversion in of 1984. The it's not very confident that there was much attention paid to them at that time, so in a sense, we've inherited this problem. Thanks. And before I miss, oh, sorry. I just asked a question about the budget. In your response to our questions, you stated that the investigative phases in stages one and two have already been completed and paid for. When I'm looking at the budget, I'm just wondering for stage two, it has the VBA consultant's fees of 10,000, is that the same as the investigative fees, or is it just a portion of that? I have to see it. Get your glasses. Need glasses just so <laughs> I can barely see you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of shady. Yeah. So just plan in. Yeah. 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 This is initial. No, this is to move forward. Oh, can, can you ask the, the question again yeah, so yeah. to make sure you answer you The specifics. So the, your budget has, I'm just looking at stage two because it seems yeah. like that's the thing that's on the table. Exactly. 204,000. And in the response to the question, you said the investigative phases of stages one and two have already been completed and paid for. But it wasn't clear to me what in that. Is that not right? Phase no, fake, the, fake, the, what was paid for was, uh, Stage one, essentially, and his uh, uh, assessment of the stairs, assessment of uh, 
where it, where it might go to uh, take care of it. His suggestions to shore, uh, contacts with contractors, uh, the initial document that we got from uh, Boston Bay Architects, I think Richard has it in his hand, uh, and that was for something. Yeah. And then uh, this second part is much more complex. It gets him to us, you know, like he becomes the clerk of the works or right. Boston Bay Architects. But he hasn't undertaken any of that work. Not, no. We, that was my confusion. Right. About that. Sorry about that. So important to remember, we can we can approach this in stages. We are we pushed forward in order to be able to make sure to have our application in with you. We did think this work uh, in the emergency and temporary shoring would be done. We, like everybody else, definitely got fouled up by the winter weather. So we're we're still here. <laughs> Lucia, there are a couple more questions. Right. Is there any public meeting space in the old town? No. No. There's so not. So the only people who use it are the condo, private condo folks. Is that correct? Correct. It, it was all made into residences. And all the neighbors who walk through. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. And use our, our dumpster <laughs> and recycling. <laughs> the thing I'm trying to wrap my yeah. head around is the use of public funds for mm -hmm. private condo association. I think I can address that in. Um, some way. Um, yes, we are private, but we consider ourselves stewards of what was a public space and, and remains um, kind of the, the pinnacle of, of the neighborhood and the Ward 3 character. And, and you know, it, it is an iconic building. Um, and um, we, we came to it via, via a public route and um, we're part of the community. Um, I, we did understand that we, we are eligible, just like First Churches was. Now we we're slightly, we obviously have a different use, but um, but that we would be eligible still, even though we are a private entity. Well, it helps you. I think First Churches is a public space. That's why Brian's yeah. question went there. This right. this project is closer to the buildings on South Street that we just worked on there once again. Yeah, but those are low-income, so they have a characteristic right. that, that yeah. um, And we are not low-income, but we are definitely um, on the affordable side of life in the country. We have, you know. And I assume this was like the D.A. Sullivan building that sold for $84,000. So what did the building come to you in the beginning? How did that $150,000, something like that. Say again? Something like 150000 that, I mean, that was it, the, develop, the developer paid that, yeah. and then yeah. pretty much ignored the uh, skin of the building and you know, went inside. But we, our condominiums are much more modestly priced, so we're, we're not, we're not high end. <laughs> the Stonely condominiums in Dedham, uh, one two bedroom unit just sold for $712,000. And this, I'm going to be surprised. <laughs> it, it's, it's quite a lot of relief. Now, the range of price for the condominiums was specified in the uh, proposal process, and they were to cost between fifty and eighty-five thousand dollars per unit. But that in 18, 1986 dollars. Uh, as far as the, uh, the neighborhood and, and meeting space, it, it's not there. But uh, the grounds uh, act. Uh, at least I feel, and I get comments from all of our neighbors, both on Cherry and Union, that it acts as an anchor uh, and a sort of stamp sets a standard uh, for the atmosphere of the street, uh, the houses around it. Uh, people, as Margaret said, use it as a cut through and admire the gardens, uh, you know, from Cherry to Union. So we are uh, fairly integral to that uh, area of the community. I, I think we can um, safely say that we played a huge role in the in the um, restoration of the whole area, the whole neighborhood. I mean, when I first moved to town, Union Street was not nice, nor was Graves Avenue, and 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 those have been really nicely redone now. And I think that's in large part because of the fact that this big, beautiful building exists in the middle of everything. 
and, and the school is right there, and um, it's, it's um, a, a central part of the community. Question as far as um, so the roof the roof has been you know, redone and I'm assuming that when you had your masons on site they were looking for water intrusion sort of in the area of the facade where the steps were actually attached uh, where the staircases were attaching. I'm just wondering, in terms of other issues, do you have any information that has been developed over? That was what uh, years of maintenance that might say where that, where that would go. Where we we have an awareness of uh, obviously the the state of the building itself right. because it's uh, so old and that uh, the brick walls are essentially two layers of brick with a hollow core inside. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of expertise to come back to us, and so the the, the Boston Bay architects who seen and dealt with the buildings and when they showed up on the scene and we went and looked under the stairs they went oh yeah it's the da 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 right. where prior to that uh, all we were hearing was well uh, I haven't seen anything like this but I guess I can do this or right. I can do that and it's the same with the exterior so uh, we're feeling confident that we should spend the money to get a plan to keep the historic nature of the building in place through someone who's passionate about it and no, that's their business. So that's why we're going into this uh, phase three part of it. It was an excellent question, and there, I'm sure there is some water intrusion in places, but um, we need advice. We need someone to control the situation a little bit to lay it out. And we also time, need to usually when you, when you pull a roof off, it's a great time to see right, where water would have been. That's where most of the water is hitting. Well, I, I think, yeah. And you know, uh, said there was, I guess there was deterioration of some of the chimneys those were masonry chimneys that were taken off and then the cupola was also pulled so cupola was pulled right i mean when those things were taken off i would assume that there was you know not a not a full-on exploratory you assessment, would but but you would think there would be some, some information you would have been developed you would but uh, <laughs> uh a, a lot wasn't and there was some, a little bit of brick replacement you know where the roof met the walls and right. there was some venting put in but uh it wasn't a uh it wasn't enough diligence the right. same thing when the, when the walls were penetrated to put in the new windows um, that are along the driveway. I'm wondering whether, and again, you're, you're punching yeah. masonry that's been intact for, at that point, 100 years plus. That would be a great time it, to it would see. Be. And, and, and all this, you know, it was somebody else's uh, uh, gig at the time. And, right. and Again, not yeah, I was just curious. I was just curious. In yeah, I, I wish. Looking forward. I wish we could have been up looking down from the roof and right. looking through the sidewall and uh, <coughs> etc. That's, that's really in large part what trying to move to stage three is all about. Is yeah. that we want to be able to anticipate this and plan for it in a fiscally responsible way. And, and water penetration has been identified already by Boston Bay Architects as a, a major problem that we need to need to consider. Thank you very much. Um, you. There are no further questions from the committee. Yeah. We will update you as soon as we get uh, more definite information uh, about our stage one results. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, the next application that we have is an application for funding for the interactive online map. Yeah. It's exactly how they looked in 1710. <laughs> 
Well, I'm Nancy Rexford. I'm from historic Northampton. And uh, we have a, a project that is not a building project. And it's for a, an online interactive map. And we have our electronic devices working. remember where I'm going by looking at the slides, so it's a definitely a challenge of my memory to, to do this all from uh, without the pictures to help me. Um, but there's no doubt where I wanted to begin, which was to thank you guys for the very generous funding that you've offered us to deal with the most urgent and dangerous of the structural problems we're dealing with at Historic Northampton. We are really grateful. There's no way we would be doing it without you. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And this sort of second thing um, is given the extent of the uh, physical plant problems, uh, I assume you were all kind of surprised when we marched in here immediately with something that had nothing to do with our disastrous buildings. Um, so I wanted to explain, I did try to explain that in uh, and what uh, we sent you, but I was going to also do it here. Um, if you want to just go from there, I can send the presentation to everybody. Yeah. Okay. So they're great pictures, and there's lots of fun. There's even an animated one that I learned how to do. Um, so you. Part of the reason why this doesn't focus on a physical plant is what you all read about in the Gazette recently. I assume all of you have seen the articles in February about our um, pretty terrible financial shape. And you can probably have some idea from having seen me in here before how hard we are working to turn that around. So um, I wanted to uh, use a metaphor. And I had such nice pictures. I always feel so disappointed. To done all this work and not get to share it. Um, when you jack up a house, you cannot just jack one corner up in the air or you're going to break the house. And if we simply threw all of our energy right now into dealing with a physical plant, which needs lots of help, admittedly, um, we would not save the organization. Because I, I mean, I can clean mold and, and uh, replace rotten beams uh, until there are none left. And if nothing happens out in public, we die. So we can't, um, we have to work on all sides together. So I wanted to give you a bit of an update on, on the physical plant just to begin with. Um, the um, CPC grant will take care of the major structural problems and, and stabilize the parts and stuff. That was the single most important thing. The second most important thing was to uh, deal with the windows in Damon House, which were in terrible shape. And we've already got eight of them out um, for the winter, thank goodness. Um, another thing that we'll deal with is all the asbestos, the mold, and the uh, fiberglass in Shepherd House, which was a disaster. And the fact that uh, Abide has come in with a very, very low uh, bid, and I talked to Sarah about, about this, means that we will be able to pay for it from the CPC grant that's already been granted, and it means that I will not be doing it personally. And I'm really grateful for that, <laughs> um, because that was, that was quite a job. So um, you'll remember that in our, that proposal actually went through a number of stages in conversation with you folks. And we had talked about um, replacing furnaces as one of the first things. We did not do that with the grant. But we did replace one furnace in Parsons House. Um, it was a, the asbestos all got removed. A new gas boiler was put in. Um, the pipes were approved by the historical commission, and 
Uh, and now, as of this day, um, in spite of the very bad winter, our heating bill in Parsons is less than 50% of what it was the last year. So that's really helping on the money side. Um, we also uh, worked very hard on the basement of Parsons House. And I really, this is where I really wish you could see some of the pictures of what it was like. Uh, we had to actually put the hazmat suits on and the masks and the goggles, the, the whole thing. And, um, and Parsons' basement is cleaned out, thanks to Kim Graham over there in the tan. Uh, she and her husband uh, were the volunteers who came and pulled down all the fiberglass with attendant rat, uh, mouse nests and debris that would all come down on your head while you were trying to take it down. So that's all clean, and most of it's been disinfected. Um, there were 200 moldy shutters in that basement that had to be carted out. They're, they're not disposed of because we have to decide historically what we're going to do with them, but they're out. Um, we have uh, started to do, our point of view was to deal with, with water coming into the building first. That just seemed like, to, as well as the main structural things. So um, we had a mason, Paul Corpita, come in and um, he's dealt with uh, foundation repairs in both Parsons and uh, in Shepherd. And these are incidentally things that we're paying for. Those are not grant things, but I just want you to know that some of the, the issues that um, you saw when you visited um, are being <coughs> taken care of. Um, so we also had a lot of tree work done so that it's a lot safer to walk around the ground. Um, the den where the bear took shelter a year ago in Northampton is now gone and has exposed two molds, two windows which will have to be removed because they're so disintegrated. Um, and uh, in an attempt to control water, we also redid the flash around the chimney um, Damon House because we had water coming down through the asbestos in uh, the Damon Basin. So that's all been taken care of just before the snow came. We had to go through the Historical Commission for a number of these things. And by that time, we sort of ran out of the year in which we could work. So um, we all we got that much done, uh, which was significant. And we'll pick it up as soon as we can. Um, on this, so that's one side of the house. And with the CPC grant, we're really making pretty significant progress. It's, it's not the end. One of you asked me for a list of, of what we foresee, and I did, I did send that in um, as best we can tell. You never know to uncover things. Um, but the second side of the house is our, that has to be jacked up is the public programming, and that's been a thing that Stan Shearer, our vice president, has been working on. Um, so he's been running um, a monthly series of exhibits on contemporary art that are all connected to our collections and all come with a, a, a lecture that's related in some way. He has a monthly film series and many other miscellaneous lectures. In fact, the, the audiences were getting so big for them that we decided that we needed to take down the permanent exhibition and make room for uh, make a more flexible space where we could show things but also have um, a larger audiences. So we did that and <coughs> painted it. Kim painted it. <laughs> and uh, I painted one coat. She painted the other coat. And, uh, and that's getting a place where we can now start to show our collections. And collections is one of the other sides of this house. Um, Marie Panic put up a wonderful exhibition, which I hope you'll see if you haven't been over on the Pro Brush uh, Company and how it developed from about 1850 to about 1950. And it's, that is a major industry in Northampton and a very important one um, in terms of the history of plastics in the United States. Uh, so it's interesting to see. Um, we have quite a collection of stuff from that industry. Um, we cleaned up a number of small messes, the archival archival messes um, in the collection side. And we're also starting to put together an area where we can um, allow our volunteers to work. So instead of having a big director's office, we have five desks where volunteers can come and they can leave their work when, until they come back the next time, which is a lot more efficient than having to put everything away, who knows where, um, to use a space for something else. So, um, and we, after the Gazette article, uh, the, uh, 
volunteers are, are calling and getting in touch frequently. I'm going to be talking tomorrow um, uh, with Sarah Lennox, who is interested in being a volunteer coordinator because I can't keep track of all of it. Um, and we are um, hoping to really uh, involve a lot of people in, especially in accessioning and cataloging, and then of course things like breaking the, breaking the lawn and doing a lot of the, you know, the, the maintenance, that, uh, the, the regular kind of uh, unskilled maintenance, I would say. We also have a couple of genealogy volunteers um, who are proving to be really useful in understanding collections. So um, the fourth side then is developing a supportive community, and that's where the interactive map program really connects in terms of our goals, which are survival, and I think probably everybody in this room would rather we survived than didn't survive. So um, we, you can't just go out when you discover, you know, you can't, the board, the new board, new directors came in and discover there's no money and there's been this huge deficit and everything is a mess. And you can't just go out and say, everybody help us, unless you can, can show people that you're actually doing something worthwhile for the community. And so for us, the um, article in the Gazette actually came um, at a pretty good time because we had begun to get our house in order in terms of the physical plan and in terms of the cleaning up and in terms of expanding our public programs. So we're ready now to try to go out and um, uh, enlarge our community. To tell you how bad the problem is, the membership, I don't know what it is this week, it might be a little higher, um, but a couple of weeks ago, it was 100 and, it was 150 people of whom 50 or 75 were not local. That's an embarrassment. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And you can see why this is a very, very high priority for us to fix. So the first thing we did last year was to um, organize the program Midnight to Midnight, which was the photo documentation project where we asked volunteers from across the town to take photographs of to help document the look of, of Northampton right now. Um, and we're going to do that again um, this year. Um, <coughs> we are also reaching out to the schools. Um, the Bridge Street School is gardening in our backyard uh, at Shepherd House. We are going to be helping them celebrate their 100th anniversary this summer and have an exhibition on Northampton in the 1910s. Um, and we will be collaborating, I hope, both with them and with uh, Jackson Street, at the very least, um, on the interactive map project. We're also going to be having an archaeological dig. We are asking for uh, a grant from the Mass Humanities in order to um, open that up to school children and the public so that we can have more people um, experience that and, and have the fun of, of uh, well, discovering what our 18th century uh, uh, forebears may have been uh, probably eating off of is what we will find. So um, there are a number of reasons why we picked the interactive map. <clears throat> we actually looked at the physical issues, and we know that the next important things are going to be the barn and Damon House. But in Damon House, we have to be able to see the framing work of the first floor and there's a ceiling in the basement. And the basement is completely full of furniture. So we have to clean the basement before we can take the, the, the ceiling down to see what the framing issues are. We know, we, we figure we're gonna have to put posts up in the basement, but we couldn't exactly give you a, a budget or anything for that project, so we thought it would be better off to wait. And a very similar problem with the barn, that we had to be able to uh, get into the barn and see the extent of the problems and uh, the tenant's um, belongings made that difficult. But the tenant is now, I think, pretty much out. I have to go, I haven't had time today to go over and see. But I think that that situation is now under control and we'll be able to see what's going on in the barn. Um, we also saw this as an opportunity to give back to the town. Um, 
we feel very strongly the generosity of the town, the taxpayers' money um, that is it was expressed by your support of this organ, the struggling organization, and so we thought, okay, maybe we can do something that the town would really appreciate, and the 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 needs that we see expressing are ones that are in the sustainable Northampton document, which actually asks somebody, including us, to identify and evaluate historic resources, to educate the community and the decision makers, to use such strategies as conducting surveys, and to increase public participation. And I read that and I thought, boy, they're describing my project. That's really, that's really pretty close. Um, and also, um, it's fairly notorious that people can't find the Form Bs on the city website, and so they would be happy to be able to have those in an easier spot. And, um, and we get a lot of people coming in researching house histories. So we know that there's, that, that's one of the ways in which um, the general public, you know, not the, not the academic historians, are likely to connect with history first, is what's the history of my house, or what's the history of that really interesting house on the corner. So, is there any chance we can get, we probably can't get to the website either. We can get to the website, we don't see. <laughs> um, but the link will be in the presentation. Okay, this is really disappointing. I, I'm actually disappointed. I'm sure. I, I, this happens repeatedly. Don't take it personally, but all over the time. I, do, uh, I believe you, it just, um, words are not worth a thousand pictures. <laughs> it's the other way around. So, to prepare for this presentation, I, I spent many hours this week creating a mock-up of the website. Um, and I, I used Weebly. I guess, I think I'd like to, since I'm going to be talking, I'd like to change my order here. Um, there are, I, we heard through the grapevine that you guys have about, a budget of about $150,000 this year, this round. That's right, more or less? And you have five or six projects and, um, that are worthy, as ours are. So I sp I've spent time trying to think, OK, it's not really fair for you guys to give us every penny we're asking for. You just gave us a lot of money. So what are the, what are the options and the trade-offs, and how can we make this a less expensive project? We can't do it the way someone is trying to think of how to do it, suggested, well, could you do it neighborhood by neighborhood? That's probably not the best way to reduce the cost. But so I think there is a way. There are some trade-offs, and what I'd like to do here is explain what they are. So there really are two parts to this project. There's the map. The map has hot spots and a pop-up, and certain information on the pop-up. That's one basket of technology. The other is the website itself. And so we're um, visualizing the website in which you could click on the hot, the hot spot, the pop-up pops up, or on the side, wherever we put it, and there's a link, and that link goes to a dedicated page uh, that's only about one address, so 66 Bridge Street, which is our Shepherd House, for example. And so the website is a big, a big place with a page for, every, theoretically, for every single house house in, or building in Northampton, I'm sure it will never get to 100% of them, but it's still big. And so how do you organize all of that information and load it um, if effectively? So the website um, is a different basket of technology. On the map side, um, we Devin had suggested that we look at Maps Alive, and that's maybe where we end up um, going uh, in the final analysis. Um, what Maps Alive does is allows you to, to do a static map, which I'll explain in a minute, and it creates all the software to make a little blue blue dot on your map that turns red when you click on it, and it puts a border around your pop-up, and it puts bold things in, and puts your picture in, and all that kind of stuff, um, Maps Alive does. And it does it very well. And in my experience, the support has been very good. The problem is, um, the limitation is, that it only uses a static map. 
So imagine a map that in reality is this big, like uh, the, an 1853 map of Northampton. And you have to take a scan of the whole thing. And all the detail on that map is collected in the scan. And it's a very big file. Because when you load it in, um, you have to be able to zoom in enough to be able to read the tiny, tiny little thing that says Jay Smith lived in that house. So it's an enormous file, and it takes a long time to load. It is possible, um, and you'll see on the mock-up website that there are like four different versions of the 1831 map, and that's us trying different sizes of files. Um, there is a point where it's acceptable in the time it takes to load and in the resolution. The alternative to a static map is a GIS, Geographic Information System <coughs> map. And this is what Andy, does he say Kether? 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 Or German? Uh, in the in, uh, Department of Public Works. And I spent an hour and a half talking with him about maps. And the GIS map is a map that works like Google, where when you're looking at it from space, so to speak, you see the shape of the continent, and then you come down and you see the rivers, and after a while, you see the major roads, and then after a while, you see minor roads, and then you see the street names, and every time you press the, the Get Closer button, you see more, because the map is designed in layers of information, and it's a completely different technology than the static map. And it allows everything to go come in faster. And that is the standard for today. That's what everybody expects, because that's what Google does. Um, and you can't do that with Maps Alive. It, they just don't have that. So that those are the two choices for Maps. In the website, now this is where it's a little harder for me to explain, so I apologize for my technical limitations. But a, well, it's, again, a dynamic versus static uh, trade-off. In a dynamic website, you um, basically enter all your information in a, in a spreadsheet or a series of spreadsheets creating a database. Um, and it could be references to, to photos um, on your um, host or paragraphs of text or whatever. And when the user says, gee, I want to, I, I'm going to click on that hotspot and I want to bring up 66 Bridge Street, the computer works very hard and assembles all the information it needs for 66 Bridge Street and it, and it puts it up right then. It's, uh, they would say, on the fly. Then there is a, a second form, which I'm hoping that we actually use the middle term where we can use it. Um, where you can put all your information in a database, but you just upload it. You say, oh, OK, I'm done for the day. I'm going to upload it. And then it stays there static until you go back and you upload some more. So that's a kind of middle ground. A completely static website, <coughs> every change has to be made manually on the web page itself. Um, so there aren't any, there's no ability to upload in batches. So we have you know, 5,000 deeds, you can't find a way to upload 5,000 deeds in batches. It has to be one by one by one on all the separate pages. So those are the trade-offs. Um, static versus dynamic website, um, uh, a static map versus a map in layers like Google. The, we haven't, I have to say, uh, my mother, who's 93, got sick. Flu, hospital, transfer to nursing home, move all of her stuff to assisted living. That's been my month, and so I'm not quite as far along in my research for this as I would have liked to be because life on the light is in the last few weeks. Um, however, um, I am not yet aware of a software that does what Maps Alive will do for a GIS map. Andy didn't know of one. And he's kind of put out a call to his cronies on his <coughs> chat forum and know the answer. <coughs> so we may find one, but I haven't found it as of today. Um, the the uh, site that you will see uh, when you go online uses Maps Alive 
and uses Weebly, which, as you probably know, is is a very easy way to build a website using templates. And I just picked one and started building a website, and I found it joyously easy, <laughs> really wonderful, and began to wonder whether it was all that much harder to put the data up on, on a website like that, as opposed to Dreamweaver, which we've used, and it's very slow and time consuming. But the Weebly thing, you just press a button and it's, it's up there. So it's really not that hard. So my feeling is that for our own needs, for Northampton Historical needs to, to make itself known to the public now. We actually can't wait. We don't have that time. So we have to go ahead with this project one way or the other. Um, if there is any funding that is available, then I will use it for people and maybe a computer. Um, because I need help, I, you know, because if I don't get anything, then I have to add it to my personal to-do list. And try to organize volunteers who can help me. It would be really <coughs> nice if you could have somebody who could manage a lot of the bulk of the work and also manage the volunteers to help. But we're already starting to get people who, um, I, I met a guy from Middletown, Connecticut, who is researching the Bowers House. And he's always said, oh, sure, he'll write the page of all the information about the Bowers House. Um, and I think people like that will start to appear the more we, um, we do this. Um, Jane Slattery here is a fantastic genealogist. And she's already helped me figure out that Myrtle Street, where I used to live, is an Irish neighborhood. Um, and we worked with the census. We worked with um, the local directories. And um, it's kind of fun. It's really kind of fun. So, so the static site may not be perfect, but it is acceptable and better than nothing to go forward with. And I envision this as a place where ultimately there will be such a wealth of information, not just about the places, but about the families. We can have additional pages on the site that will talk about neighborhoods, like my old neighborhood where I lived on Myrtle Street, which was developed, Loose Stone wrote the book 17 Summer about that neighborhood that was developed in the 1870s. Um, it's, as you trace it along, you realize that by 1900, it was all Irish and French Canadian. And so you get this, this cha wonderful changing picture. And when you look, if you, if you go to the 16 Myrtle site, you'll see a House Brothers picture from 19. You also let's see a picture when we were there in 1981 and my son was 15 months old and raking the leaves, helping his dad rake the leaves with a stick. Um, and I think that would give you an idea of, of how, what this site could be for the town. Um, I've already talked to Gwen Agna, the principal at Jackson Street, and she's really interested in having students, kids help both research using it and also add to the map. So it's a both creating a historical record, this whole town creating a historical record, and also being able to use it. Okay. Could you just summarize then what you're asking? Because it sounds like you're revising your request, and I'm not sure I've got what you're requesting. In terms of the money amount? amount? Yes, and what it will be used for. Um, I don't have a, the original um, grant uh, total, the project total was 72,000, as I remember. I don't have this in front of me, I'm sorry. Um, it was roughly 2,000 something for the equipment and a roughly 30,000 uh, for all that website design and 40,000 for a person. My highest priority, other than maybe getting a piece of equipment for that person to work on, would be for the person to help. And so if it's a full-time person, it's $40,000, including some health insurance. Um, if we can't get a full-time person, if you haven't got a penny, a hate will do. If you haven't got a hate me, then God bless you. I'm wondering about with Andy, did he mention that the city is planning on doing an aerial map? City in the spring. No, he never mentioned that. Is there any way that could play into plans? Um, I don't know. Um, the the real um, 
trade-off is that GIS map, which you can get through Google, uh, versus the static map. I mean, so the old ones will be static, like the 1830 map will be static, the 1833 map, they'll be static maps. Um, but it's that, but the primary map that people would go to would be a contemporary today map. Um, that's where people would start. Um, I appreciate your comprehensive big picture um, presentation. It's helpful, and I'm new to the committee, so I don't have the experience um, that the other members might have. Um, I mean, uh, in terms of the urgency of this, and you're saying like we just don't have the time. We need to build our community and make ourselves better known. And I agree with your earlier statement that there is a standard of what people expect when they go to a website, and if it thinking to use, they will not return. And so I'm a little bit concerned that you're saying you can back off of what you know will be a dynamic thing and it'll still be good enough. And I don't know if that's my lack of understanding I think what it is. this is where if, if we could have shown you the website, mm -hmm. you would have been able to make a judgment about that. And then we'll see. It sounds like this will yeah. get to us. Um, and one piece you didn't say, and I'm sure you're thinking about in planning, and I wonder if you could speak to, is just um, there's the presence, which is very important, and having people know who you are and know what you will have to offer. And there's, you know, somebody in charge of development and plan giving and all of that. And you just haven't really named that specifically. So there's this urgency around this, and it does take somebody to make it happen. And just if you can talk more about, you know, what is what, you know, of these 150 members, you know, what else is happening to try to oh. bring resources in to okay. yes. help you with that. Thank you, actually, because cool. I had planned to talk about that, and I just, it wasn't on my, didn't get on my mental trajectory as I moved through it. Um, the, first of all, um, our staff is sitting right there in the purple sweater. That's Marie, and I panic, and she does everything. Um, she's our only paid person. I'm on the board, Kiki's on the board, Kim is on the board, um, Stan Sure couldn't be here tonight, but he does programs. Um, we don't have a development person. We just have people who are trying our best. So obviously one of the things we're doing is applying for grants. And the grants we applied for this in the last two months alone were this one. One for the uh, archeological dig from Mass Humanities, which would be $5,000, which we would match. We already raised over $3,500 from Valley Gives for that archaeological dig. Um, we're applying, oh yes, yeah, so and this is really important. We are applying to the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts um, for, I just put their maximum number on, $25,000. Um, but I am not at all sure that we will get that money because the this is very painful to say, but this organization has been badly enough managed that if you're not in this town and care about it uh, and have some gut feeling that maybe the people there are really trying to turn it around right now, then if you're off in Boston someplace or wherever, you may think, well, why should we give money to a place like that? Um, when they're in such bad shape. So the fact that, that we've been running these deficits for so long, um, which I think, not, I think we're not gonna do that this year, incidentally, um, will make us much less competitive for <coughs> I will hope that maybe they will give us something and that maybe if you can give us a little and they can give us a little, we'll get at least that half-time person out of it and that that would be enough to, to get started. So Community Foundation of Western Mass is for this project. Okay. Um, the, fourth, um, uh, the fourth one is from the Beverage Family Foundation, which gives money to um, the Pioneer Valley. Um, and we asked them for four um, high quality industrial dehumidifiers, one each for each of the basements. It's the one thing that was not in, this, in the CPC grant. And there's a specific type that everybody who's an expert in this field recommends, and it's a uh, low energy use and blah, 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 blah. It's supposed to be the best. Um, so we're hoping that that wouldn't be, that we could make a case in spite of our bad financial situation, that they would say, well, we don't want 
it, still we want to save their collections, even even so. So I tried to make that as easy for them to say yes to as possible. And and collection care and equipment are, are on their list of things they like to fund. So those are four grants. Um, when the um, when the articles came out in the paper, um, there was quite an outpouring of help. And um, so we are in conversation with donors who are interested in matching significant amounts of, of, of donations in order to develop membership. And I'm not, it isn't to the point where I can tell you the details yet, um, but but I think that that will happen. Um, we have, uh, our, our, most of our board, <coughs> almost the entire board, came here and looked at envelopes for a couple of <laughs> hours, uh, several hours the other day, and sent out mailings to all the people who had been members in the last, what was it, five years? Yeah. So, and some of them come back, they've moved and things. Um, but that's an attempt to reach out. And how much did you say had come in in the last three days? 3,400. Okay. So, um, and so that those, you know, so certainly increasing membership is, is a very, very high priority and expanding the membership and having, um, opportunities for people to volunteer. And, well, one of the things that we wanted to do in this project that I didn't mention was to make a big splash through the paper and everything and ask everybody in, in Northampton to take a picture of their house. This is a very simple thing for people to do in this day and age. But when people do a small thing for you, they have invested in you in a way that makes them more likely to support you later on. So there's a psychological reason Ask. And then, of course, we don't have to, do, um, to depend on Google Street Maps. We have photographs of all the houses for the interactive map um, that, that our people have created, sending us pictures of their own house. And some people may choose to send interiors or backyards. That will be up to them. Um, that will enrich the site. And so that's one of the ways we really want to reach out. And it's one of the reasons we're trying to go through the school. So, um, so children might um, talk about what they would want people to know about their house or something they loved about their house or a picture of them at Thanksgiving dinner or that kind of thing. boundary of the key properties we're trying to protect in here. Um, and basically trying to go from the Moose Lodge at the end of Cook Avenue all the way up to the Hatfield line, sort of following the water face, which is the most important one. Um, this is a 25-acre parcel about a quarter of a mile north of the Moose Lodge. We've been interested in acquiring it for a while. Um, it has some very rich beaver habitat. Um, the beaver are actually flooding Boggy Meadow Road, so on this property gives us a chance to manage that, that property. And it fills in sort of an in the um, If you look at the, the map, of, the zoomed out map of the entire area, you can see the green all the south of the land, you know, way down to the south, the southeast side of the property, it's a, it's east, east side of the uh, conservation of the property we are talking about. On the zoomed in map, you see two green outlines. That that those two part that represents the 43 acres, the answer porch, 
family owns, it's the northerly 25 of that that we just bought. So we're not trying to acquire their house or the land near a house. We're trying to acquire the land along Bobby Meadow Road. Um, Bobby Meadow Road is not a city street. It's a private road that only people who have access, the people who own property there have the right to use. Um, and we've always wanted to own all the properties along Boggy Meadow Road. We actually installed a gate 10 years ago with the hopes that someday we'd own all the property along the road and could close the gate. Um, and this, this is one of those key parcels. We just acquired the property across the street from this one last year. Um, that was the last year they should have. So we think it tells an important story. The price is fairly low. This land doesn't have a lot of development value. Um, we worry the property owner could damage it in terms of do a bad a timber cut or do other ways to damage the property, but it's not going to go and be a seven because it's not. Okay. So I'm gonna... I'll stop there and try some questions for you all. The, the, in the map, there's a dividing line between the two, but the both parcels are pieces. No, we're only requiring the, north, the, the northeasterly one. The one closer to Boggy Meadow Road. So we, we, the map shows the entire 43 acres that's now privately owned, and just the northerly circle of the one. Just that the The acquisition price is about thirty-one thousand dollars. Broad Brook uh, Coalition is contributing five thousand dollars towards it. We have five thousand dollars on hand from previous fundraising. So we're asking your help for that. Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know what sort of situation we're in after the housing round for the last time. So um, why not? Next, what would happen if it were next round? Um, we have some who's willing to sell to us. We're to, somehow or other, frankly, we're going to figure out a way to go forward on the property because we don't want to lose it. If it's not funded from you all, you know, we often come before you and sort of try to show matches for the property. Um, if it's not funded, we would probably have to do additional fundraising campaign and use all the funds we have on hand. But we don't want to lose this, this property. And so right now you've got 10000 on hand. Correct. And, and we love CPA, but there is a cost <coughs> doing CPA projects because the requirement for the conservation restriction. So the cost of the the cost of the deal drops about five thousand dollars. We don't use CPA money. So the gap, if you don't fund the thirty one thirty thousand, is twenty five thousand. Did BBC say they? I know you said something about BBC chipping in. Have they committed anything? They committed. So they committed um, six thousand dollars, five thousand dollars towards the acquisition, and a thousand dollars to help deal with the beaver issues on the property, like beaver to beaver or something. When we're, we're on the property, does the beaver problem exist? Um, so it's flat. So on the, the easterly side of the property is Boggy Meadow Road, mm -hmm. and Boggy Meadow Road is being flooded by beavers that are on the property that are maybe 100 yards west of Boggy Meadow Road. Um, we haven't, obviously, it's, there's a lot of snow out there. So there's two solutions to Boggy Meadow Road problem. One is doing beaver deceiver pipe. One is bringing some gravel to raise biking at a road that we aren't going to know which makes more sense to the summer. Has this been a persistent beaver problem? It's been a persistent problem. It's getting worse. So you can go <coughs> past the road, through the road. The road is a little spongy. The road is important to both from a trail standpoint. And from that standpoint, the flooding is not that bad. But it's our only way to bring in vehicles to maintain the, the dam itself. Um, and so we you know, want the road not to, to fall apart. Yeah. And the application says that this serves as one of the most popular access points on Fitzgerald Lake. Where is that access? So you go down um, Cook Avenue to Pines Edge, and just beyond Pines Edge, at Pines Edge, the street changes from Pines Edge to Boggy Meadow. The old Moose Lodge is there. A lot of people drive up to the Moose Lodge and park their cars there. And <coughs> Can I ask a question? Point out on that where that is. Yeah. Uh, so behind Lowell, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what it's at. And then people access to Bobby Messenger. Right. And is there 
Are there other trails that exist on the property? Yeah, the whole area is interlaced with trails. So Broadway Coalition does all the trail maintenance. So the city, you know, our model is always we buy land, we do capital expenditures, and we find partners who do the trails. Broadbrook is by far our most successful partner. But are there, are there trails on the parcel that you intend to acquire? No, there's not trails right now. So this trail along Boggy Meadow is a boundary of the property, but not in the Is there potential, I'm sorry, is there potential for trails? Wayne, it's pretty wet. It's pretty wet. Um, you'd have to put a bog bridge in, yeah. and so that we, again, we would tend to defer to BBC whether right. they want to do that. They always have internal debates about not too many trails that scare wildlife, but enough trails for recreation, so we would leave it to them. But it wouldn't be an easy trail. I mean, you could do a boardwalk, but that's And it's mostly to be able to maintain the beaver issue. Right. Okay. Well, no, but in terms of the acquisition, it's also, the problem, we always worry about the 43 acres this is part of, and there's some other land in the same family. We always worry about the westerly side of it being developed. So the easterly side is underwater, no one could develop it. Of the 25 acres, and we haven't mapped this exactly, so it's just from the air photo, my guess is about 15 acres of wetlands, it's not going anywhere, and 10 acres is upland. Um, but that's all on the west side. Is it, I don't the option agreement that you have is, is actually fairly long because it looks like you don't have to exercise until uh, September 30th. So I'm, I'm wondering um, whether you could explore an extension to allow this to go into another round. Yeah, we, per, we potentially could. I mean, you know, she gave us that long because we explained we need to apply for CPA funds. If you guys vote for this, we don't get a council off until July, then we do title search, mm -hmm. and that brings us to September. And she frankly wanted a shorter time period, but was willing to do this. So we certainly could raise that, but there's mm -hmm. no guarantee. Other than the logging, what else it looks to me like we're paying more than a thousand dollars an acre for land that can't be anything but wetlands. So I'm, I'm missing why. What what other market would she have for this? Well, as part of because our house is off a of bridge road, right. she could develop that property over there. Because as I say, you know, the, the westerly ten acres that potentially could be developed. But I mean, right? We're, we're in essence paying back land value, and back land is more about someone doing bad things to the property not becoming a subdivision. Yeah, I'm just I'm confused a little bit in terms of the area that you're saying. Are you saying area within parcel 17B3 that's developable? Or are you actually saying that there's a, a the, the area that's shown on this north edge of the part that you're concerned about development. So it's sort of the westerly edge that would most be concerned about it, and it the other property that she owns. Okay. Um, just because looking at, you know, obviously this has not been, there's no RDA that's been put in for it. The, the mass GIS layer shows the wetlands even pushing farther even across the boundary of one of those parcels. So yeah, sure. as you say, it has been delayed. So these are just from their high elevation air flow piece. Right. But certainly, even on Boggy Boggy Meadow Road is a wet. I, I think it yeah. starts from walking the property. It seems like the westerly side starts getting higher and drier. And I guess Pine Brook is perennial. So then you have riverfront 200 feet on either side of that, uh, which would significantly complicate their approach to have to bridge <coughs> That's why I think the bigger risk is sort of bad management of the property than it is homes or something. And they also, where a house is, they don't really have frontage. So I don't think they could, you know, building, you could technically build a road, but the cost would be so astronomical, I don't think that's likely to happen. So it's really just more how to get managed. Is there, is there any potential for buying the other portions along the Boggy Meadow Road? Where does that stay? Yeah, I mean, we've had conversations with all the neighbors. The property immediately north of this. Mm -hmm. So it's Frank Hansen Porch died a couple of years ago. Um, we're dealing with one of his daughters who has this property. 
the property immediately north of this is owned by somebody else in the family. I'm not sure who. Um, we're, you know, we've made clear we'd love to buy that. The property south is owned by um, some children. Someone actually used to be a historical commission. They now live in New, New Hampshire. We approached them a couple years ago, and the time wasn't right. But we sort of, you know, we have our list of things with people we follow up every year or two to say, is the time right now? So everybody out there knows we're interested. Um, I don't think it's going anywhere for development. We'd like to fill that in and own the land. But we, we you know, we just, um, with CPA money, we've been doing uh, assessment for Sanders of uh, invasive plants all over the city. You know, it's a part of the guess is, no surprise, along trails and along roads are where most of the invasives are. So we want to own land for, to be able to manage whether it's managed fever or manage invasives, to be able to manage the property in its entirety, even if all your mirrors are never be developed. question about the, the curing the what seems like the, the beaver dam that's really in the road is fairly new um, and I'm just wondering about that and when you look at it it's clearly this was all one large wetlands complex and the road is a, a bad mistake I mean, it's, a, it's a good export you know, you bring dry high dry land right into the middle of wetland um, there's there's a lot of impact so I would think that the gravel on top of that would just fix the problem until the gravel spreads and it subsides into the wetland. I'm wondering if you know, that would be something that, um, as far as, you know, you say that the risk to the property is bad management. I mean, that seems to me like bad management. Um, obviously, you, you, do need, you do need to get to the dam for maintenance, but um, so is there any way to commit to basically avoiding that, whether you do it with more aggressive management of the you know, beavers or commit more money for basically budget more money for beaver receivers yeah. to bring that water level down. You know, and try to do less in terms of intervention to basically build what's good, a dike between a much larger wetland complex. Yeah. Both routes are constant headaches. Neither are good solutions. So Phil for exactly the reason you said, you know, we have had three calls a year for person maintains the beaver receivers if it's show like dam. Right. Um, and it's, so beaver receivers are also very high maintenance. Now, I will say, if we're talking about a 10-year planning horizon, longer term, um, there's two better routes we'd like to do. Not from, from a pedestrian standpoint, you could keep beaver at a body metal road, open it up where the, where the culverts are, mm -hmm. and put a, bog, put a uh, you know, bridge across there. Right. The long term in terms of vehicle access is one of two things. There's an old telephone line that goes right by their home and goes to the dam. And we have begun the conversations with them about could we buy right away, not for the public, but just for vehicle access. Right. That would be the shortest distance, the least wetlands impact, and that would be ideal. There are two property owners we'd have to deal with, and so that's a long-term piece. And then off Mary Jane Lane, um, there's only one property owner that road is not in as good shape, but it's a much shorter distance. So the long term is I hope we stop using the, the body of the road <coughs> for any other pedestrians. But the other, so we have those conversations, we're looking into them, but it's actually a 10 years one year before it. Where's Mary Jane? It's the, um, all the 1950s ranch houses, sort of near Arcanum Field. Oh, yeah. Um, is that Mr. Fitzgerald? Yeah. He just saw it recently, it's his family. So he negotiated. So that what used to be the, the, in, the improper formal access that was used for So, the interesting, in 1974, when the city buy the property, we had an easement from Mary Jane Lane, which said we have the right to use it to access the dam, not for the public, right. until such time as we have another access to the dam. The question for our city solicitor is, what if we lose that access because it floods? If we lost Mary Jane Lane forever, we would get it back. If the right to get it back, we wouldn't have to buy it. If it doesn't come back, we'd have to negotiate to buy that. And so we want to resolve the legal issue before we <coughs> proceed. <coughs> right, there are no further questions. The next item is in Seth Thomas Fire Restoration. This is brought forward by the Northampton Historical Commission and the Office of Planning and Sustainability. So, you all approved, do you have different members since your last vote in December? So, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
So um, the Seth Thomas clock was this gorgeous clock designed by Seth Thomas. He designed a total of, I forgot the number, it's relatively small. It might be in here, a thousand clocks or something like that. Um, it was installed in front of what's now local burger when Calvin Coolidge was mayor. Um, and so we have this pictures of Calvin Coolidge of the, you know, the ribbon cutting forward. And it remained there until the early 90s. Um, and then the clock was removed and it's been stored in a, it, it was partially dismantled. A couple of parts were lost in the process. Um, and it's been stored in this warehouse in, in Holyoke ever since. Um, you all approved us acquiring the clock. We're in the process of doing it. So we have funding, we, we had an option to buy the clock. We have funding with, with CPA money to buy the clock. We're in the process of doing it. The is actually going down tomorrow to look at the clock to figure out if something they can move themselves or if we have to hire somebody else. We look at the police department, see if we can store it there, or again, if we have to store it somewhere else. So we're, those things are a little bit in flux. Um, you can guess for clock is outdoors. <coughs> Temperature doesn't matter for storage, but weight very much does. We can't put the 2,000 pound clock in my office, for example, where I hope to put it, but they told me where to go with the pots. Um, and water matter matters. Because even though it rains outdoors, it's not as humid as basements are. So it's not quite as easy to find a home for it as you'd think, because we can't put it in people's basements. Um, so we have sort of a plan. Either we're we'll going to be paying $50 a month, either $800 to, to move it, and then $50 a month to store it, or the equivalent in terms of city donations to, to move it and store it to city property, or possibly some company. My hire someone to move it and store it. So, so we've resolved that piece. Um, DPW has agreed it would be a really wonderful addition to the Plasky Park redo. The um, designers of Plasky Park, the landscape architects, have identified a spot for it. Um, their budget is showing a concrete pad to hold the clock and conduit to bring power to the clock. Um, the clock is wind up, but we want power just to light it. Um, so their budget is showing all those pieces. <laughs> Um, the budget really is we have to rehab the clock. They say a couple parts were missing years ago when the clock came down, some more parts were lost in the process. Like how there was a divorce and something happened to the parts of the divorce, and so we need to do that. Um, we have three vendors who seem qualified for the question someone asked who we would go to bid to. We'd go to bid to those three vendors. Um, but we have a good estimate from one of them. Um, so we, we think we know what the price is. Maybe we can carve off a couple thousand a little bit. Um, Wayne, in case you want about winding the clock, but I'm not sure that we're, we're going to run power to the for the light. Why wouldn't we power the clock if we're going we want to, to renovate it? Because we want to keep all the works. I mean, part of it, the value is as historical works. Um, so it would be wound once a week. These things were, were not incredibly high maintenance. Um, they just got the key and wind it. So. But yeah, we want to keep all the historical works. Wayne, is, uh, is there any of them that are restored somewhere nearby? There's one in Springfield College. I've seen a picture of I've never actually been there. Um, but that's the only one I know of. Seth Thomas clocks out here. Um, I can contact one of these clock people in a more night. It would be a list of other ones around. The Springfield College is one of them. Where would be in class? So, um, as you walk in on the, on the Memorial Hall side, just a little bit in. So you, you just the right of you know if you're on Main Street looking in, just the right of Memorial Hall on the left side. Of the park. The idea of it there is to be one of those gateways that is visible both from the park and from the road. So you funded a number of these. I don't think I think the last one may have been two and a half years ago. So it hasn't been recently. Um, it's typically been about fifty thousand dollars around. Sometimes more, sometimes less. And this is lets us do two things. It lets us move very quickly to acquire small pieces of property, um, and lets us cover um, 
uh, due diligence costs for larger pieces of property so it can take advantage of it. So I'll just give you an example. Yesterday we closed on one of our smallest acquisitions ever. Half acre piece of property. Um, it was in tax title. He owed about $5,000 in back taxes. The city is waiving the back taxes. So we got the property just for the cost of back taxes. We had to record the deed. So out of your funds came $125. That's the total cost of this project. The property will be going to the city for the next few months. We'll be going to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service forever. Um, and so your $125 leverage, you know, prop, cash, leverage $5,000 in back taxes and the permanent preservation property. Much bigger ones are when we're buying, you know, we're, we're buying um, 45, 46 acres um, on Sylvester Road this year, which you guys have funded. But before we could move towards it, we need to do some due diligence. You know, before we were applied the funds for you, we would do some work to make sure the property was real, it wasn't contaminated, it had ecological value, and so we use your funds for those. Um, some of them, some of them are incredibly successful at leveraging, like the, the, the tiny one I told you, the Golash property, where it leveraged, you know, 20 times your contributions. Sometimes they're leveraging far less. Um, but it does let us move into sort of those big and small pieces without waiting for a round that would kill some of those people. How much is currently in the five million? Five thousand left. Um, and it, yeah, it's all committed. And we all have projects that are going through the process that we have signed options for and signed approvals from city council. So even the five thousand is committed. It's committed. So essentially, it's down to zero. Well, once we finish this, things, yes. And what do you foresee? On I mean, I know the point of this is you don't know what to foresee. But yeah, I mean, I, you know the situation we're in. I mean. You, I, I think it's a great thing to have this for you to get that sort of flexibility out of. I just don't know if this funding round is when we can. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I can tell you is, in a year when we're getting funding from you guys, we buy about 150 acres of land a year. Um, roughly, it varies from year to year, but roughly half of that, sometimes more, sometimes less, is that we can do one big purchase a year and lots of little purchases. So, of the 150 acres a year we buy in good years, roughly half is the big purchase. This year we did two purchases, the one at Rocky Hill that was 45 acres, and the one at Sylvester Road that's 46, and then we're doing about 50 acres of smaller deals. So if we don't have the funds, we put those things on hold. Um, I, and I'm not trying to give you nightmare stories. Many of those are not going to, you know, Golash is a good example. Golash would not have gone anywhere. You know, he would wait till we had. So many of those would not be lost opportunities. We'd like to do them because from a staff capacity, we just, we can't keep up otherwise. Um, and some do fall. I mean, some, you know, some are at risk of going elsewhere and some are not. How much would make you feel like you could get from this year to next year? Well, the $50,000 was, I can get back to you on how it lasts. My guess is $50,000 lasts us about two years. So a quarter of that if you're asking us for one cycle, half that if you're asking us for like one year. Um, it's, it was pretty linear in that sense. That those sm yeah, the big deals are lumpy, but the small deals are pretty lumpy. We had just, you know, we had asked, and I believe we're going to get it, but there's no guarantees. We asked for $50,000 to the mayor for these tax style properties, um, which is great if we get that money, but then we need the leveraging even more because the money from the city is only for paying off the back taxes. So then all the soft costs. Say that again for me. So, there's two, when we lose in back taxes, there's two ways we buy it. When the value of the property is less than the amount of back taxes, and when we have a willing person, they write us, a, they write us what's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. We don't have to come with any cash at all to give us the property in turn in that foreclosure. That's what it's going to go like. When the back taxes are less than the value of the property, or when we can't find a person, we're doing it by eminent domain, we have to come up with the cash from both the back taxes and the non-back taxes. The mayor's given us for a number of years, or not for the last two years, is for budget reasons, money it will pay off the back taxes. So let's say I make up numbers. Well, there's one of the meadows up this, this real project. They owe about ten thousand dollars in back taxes. We think the property is worth about twelve to thirteen thousand. So if we had if the mayor given us this grant, the first 10000 we pay for for the city money, which doesn't cost the city a lot because it comes right back to the city. Right. And 
then we have to come up with three thousand dollars. Like I said, it's a good deal for the city because they didn't know how to recoup those taxes before the deal went through. Yeah, it was a good deal for the city. I mean, you know, some of the conference we could sell the butters, and so we could get money out of the ways. And, and we typically do that if we don't want the property. We don't buy for properties we don't want. We do sometimes change our priority list if it's a tax title. Um, so, anyway, so having the money from the city creates opportunities, but it also creates a need for something. Okay. So, if it's, it, it, uh, for back taxes, you still have to you still have to pay the city the money that that is owed to the city for taxes. Is that so, that? if the taxes are worth are due are more than the property is worth, uh -huh. and we have a property that's willing to do it, no, we don't have to pay back because then they give us a deed in lieu of foreclosure, uh -huh. and under state law. We treat that for books purposes and if they paid all the taxes. It's if the property is worth more than the taxes are due. If you don't pay five years taxes, that's still more value in the property inherently than what you owe us. And that way is not a way to waive the back taxes. So we, we have to pay off the taxes. But it comes right back to the city. So as you say, it doesn't really cost it. It, it. What it costs us is a year of using that money. So you know, one year, for example, the last mayor, we had the money for that, and then it was snow and moved to high school. And even though the money that we spent would come right back, it would have been a delay for a year, and we spend it, and the city can't spend it again. For the so do you treat that like its own revolving fund? We do. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a one-time fund. I mean, the city does not then it comes back to the city. But if I get 50000 and I spend 50000 in back taxes, then the money's gone, and I go back to the mayor to ask for that. Seems like it'd be a perfect revolving fund. Mm -hmm. well, it's a yearly appropriation. They can't go forward. So it's just sitting in each budget. How much? How much money might be available for that program? Has two questions with the fund. Yeah. Traditionally, the fund has been CPA that's contributed to the fund, and the so money's come from other sources. So we actually have two conservation funds. So there's a CPA conservation fund which is totally CPA. And then there is a city conservation fund, <coughs> and we often use that as, as a matching fund. So the 5,000 I mentioned that we're planning to put into the property on, on Bodney Meadow Road, mm -hmm. that's from contributions we've received in the past, that's in the fund. We put in maybe 20,000 from a fundraising campaign for the Rocky Hill Road property that we got supported. We're putting in, I think I have the number, so I'll call it that 5,000 for Sylvester Road. So we tend to do fundraising projects around each big acquisition. We, we don't frankly fundraise when we're buying an acre of land. We don't tend to fundraise when we're buying those 50 acre, 60 acre parcels of land. We do aggressive fundraising and typically get back $10,000 or $15,000 per And does the city fund go to some cost as well? Or is that for cost? Yeah, it goes for yeah. cost. It goes for soft cost as well. And so how often is that free up in comparison? To you, which one, conservation fund? How, how often is the city fund free up? So the, cons so the only city money we get is the, for the back taxes. Okay. The conservation fund is totally re upped from my fundraising and grant writing. Okay. So we do go for other grants besides you all, and we go for fundraising. But no city funds. No city funds. Okay. The only exception, um, which we do sometimes claim as a, as a match for you, is we don't pay, the city does, my office doesn't pay for legal time. Um, so when we buy land and we're spending $1,000 in legal costs, that's a city match for the project. Uh, and obviously my time. Okay. And are both established under Chapter 40 authority? Was that? Are both established, both funds established under Chapter 40 authority? So the conservation fund is established under, you're going to remember Fred and I do, whenever it conservation commissions, they're allowed to have a fund that's established by state law, HC, uh, 48, I, I'm not going to take an I'm not going to take it right. But, but the law that creates conservation commissions allows them to have a revolving fund like this. And so that's, that's what we have for that. The mayor's fund is just a capital improvement it's part of it, the annual capital improvement fund. Okay. And so the reason why I'm asking is we've had conversations over the last three years or so about whether there are limitations as a result of Chapter 40 on how the conservation funds can be used. So we traditionally see them used as soft costs, but we've had lots of small applications for uh, invasive control or other things and wonder if there's the ability of the Conservation Commission to use conservation fund monies for some of those so that we don't necessarily have to entertain 
as many applications, but that there you can have a more fluid management of our yeah. required lanes. Um, so you got one more cap to bring. Up. So the the city's conservation fund, not I mean the, the one that the Conscom is on the Conscom Act. It can be used for maintenance or capital improvements, but almost every every penny in there is from fundraising or grants. So we're limited to the way. So if somebody gave us hundred thousand dollars for maintenance or for basic control, we could absolutely use those funds. But if we're doing a fundraising campaign for land acquisition, we can use it for land acquisition and soft costs there too. We do put soft costs in every budget. We you know, I know this people buying land is sexy and, and paying for a survey isn't sexy. And we do one overall budget. So when we go out and fundraise and we say the property in Boggy Meadow Road is a thirty thousand dollar project, that's because it's a thirty thousand dollar project. Some of that is soft cost and some is hard cost. So, we do it here. so in that sense, we fundraise. And whenever we buy land, we immediately do the liability issues. So we clean up trash, we do that stuff. And that, again, we consider part of the closing costs. We do it, but we don't do um, you know, basics for capitals. And then separately, this isn't a lot of money. We get, I forgot the exact money, but about $5,000 a year from the city budget, part of my hard budget for groundskeeping. Um, and that's everything for all the properties we, we maintain. So the first thing that pays for, you basically that money always gets spent first. So the first thing that gets paid for beaver maintenance at Fitzgerald Lake Dam, or invasives or sign replacement um, comes out of 5,000, then you can guess 5,000 doesn't go incredibly far. We typically use that 5,000 for three things. Really small projects like signs, okay, you buy a piece of wood for $50 and it's not college makes it for us. Emergency things like the dam, repairs, and then we tend to have one big project, not big, but one important project a year. So like we have some concrete culverts in the Norver Conservation Area leads that we need to get out of there. And it's a big project because the trees have been growing through them for 20 years. You know, and that's going to be this year's project. And then occasionally we get, like, we got $2,500 this year from a state grant for invasive control at uh, Ella Island, and that requires a local match, and that match is partially staff time and partially from the city's grounds. So we have that money, but it doesn't go that All right, so we have come to the part of the evening which is the public comment address to the specific applications and I'll start with uh, Union Street Jail. We have by Coolidge Park Condo Association. So if anyone wishes to make a comment, please come forward, tell us your name, your address, so that the minutes can be taken. Yeah. <coughs> Good My name is Ed Skrowski. I'm a resident of 70 Beacon Street, Farnish. It's been a long time since I've spent any amount of time down here, but believe me, I'm like you. I've spent many hours in this room, and I want to thank you, and I mean it, thank you for the time that you spend deliberating on these projects. Uh, there's not probably too many people that come down here that will tell you that, because in my experience in my meetings, I can't remember one person coming down <laughs> after us of the deliberations we did for the industrial park. Uh, I'd like to speak um, about the Union Street project. I have gone over the uh, applicant's uh, information and I've gone over the uh, criteria, the general criteria. My first question would be, has this project been determined uh, applicable for CPA funds by the committee? Um, the decision there is the, the screen is whether or not the Historic Commission has made a determination that it's a significant historical resource. And I believe that we were told that the Historic Commission, the Historic Commission has. So it would be eligible because that's the statute places that as the first. But you year. haven't voted on that yet? Oh, no. We, we at the beginning, we get eligibility forms at the beginning of the round. But you approved it? Yes. Okay. As, as there's a that. copy I saw that uh, Sarah sent me was uh, not signed. Okay. Uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time because you've been here a long time already. 
but I, I would like to tell you that uh, I do represent, now that I realize I don't even know anybody around this room until Wayne showed <coughs> up and now he's <coughs> But uh, I guess I represent uh, some of the senior citizens in this community. From your information, I was born, brought up here. I've been paying taxes for 55 years now that I realized in this city. So there is a constituency out there that I see quite often, but unfortunately, they won't come down here uh, for obvious reasons. So I decided to show up tonight after Sarah helping me with the information. Thank you. And I, I've gone over this project, and I would hope that members of this committee would really look at what this project is asking for. The bottom line here is that this is a private building, a condominium complex, that now has structural problems that they are asking you and the taxpayers to fix for them. And I just can't find in these criteria uh, how this project should be funded. Uh, and I don't want to go through all of them, but I've really gone through them all, and I kind of find very little that's been presented by the people here tonight or what they've submitted in writing. I don't see any community support for this uh, other than the two letters that were submitted to you uh, by four people. So, uh, again, I want to thank you for letting me speak. And I hope that in the future meetings you have, that your, your uh, due diligence on this project will not approve any funds for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else speak to that, to that particular project? All right, in that case, the next uh, for public comment would be the interactive online map. But I'll start from Hampton. Uh, my name is Fred Zimnock. I live in uh, Ward 3. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time at the historic North Hampton. I've looked at their project. Uh, I have interest in the history of North Hampton. I think the online map project is a wonderful idea. I can think of many things that you could put on the online map that would make uh, historic North Hampton important would also educate the public as to much of the history in North Hampton, which I don't think is absolutely well known. So I'm thoroughly in support of funding for the online map project. Fred, you, you came to talk to us when we were doing the cemetery. Could, no, it's a question. Could you see any of that uh, in historic information getting... Well, I mean, one of the things I mentioned when I talked about the cemetery is the Polish exile. Mm -hmm. They came here in 1834. Very few people know that he's there. Uh, there's a lot of history behind his life in that particular time, Jacksonian America. I mean, that would make a nice spot on the online map well, to I, tell, I guess it's tell us something about the Polish exile. And I've submitted material to Historic Northampton on his life, what he did, and all that stuff. So if you wanted to write something up on a website, it's, it's in your file. You know, there's no reason that the cemetery map couldn't be one of the maps. And, and there's other things wondering. in the cemetery that could be put on there. I, I think it could. I guess my question is, who do we think would take responsibility for getting that information organized for the map? Well, the person that has a $40,000 full-time job, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, you know, I, I can contribute something that I know about in the cemetery. I could probably do Shable Wilder. Uh, Miss Slattery could probably do I don't know, a couple hundred people. Mm -hmm. She's well versed with cemetery, but that's a possibility. Yeah, I can perceive if we had had these projects. And, and the other thing, too, is once this material goes into that website data file, it's now available for other materials. You can put it into other documents. Mm -hmm. So you could probably take all the material on the cemetery that's in there and produce a short document explaining who's in the cemetery. I mean, there's all sorts of things. The Rose Tree Inn would be a nice thing to put on there. People don't know about it. You go by and see Duffy's Tire, but at one time that was the Rose Tree Inn, which has a remarkable history with Smith College. 
So there's a lot of stuff to put on there. I, I could foresee if we had gotten those two projects in reverse order, we would have probably put a condition on the cemetery to, you know, organize its information. Anyway, I think it's a great idea. You should support it. Thank you. Since my name's being thrown around. <laughs> my name is Jake Slatter. I live at 340 Florence Road. Um, I'm very much in support of this project. In response to your question about the cemetery, if anyone goes on find a grave and you look for a name and you see the name P.K. Magruder, that's me. P.K. Magruder was actually my cat. It's a long story. I won't worry about it. And this would tie in very nicely with your cemetery project. One of the things I am interested in because I do genealogy is old houses. And if I can find where someone lived, I can take a picture of their house and I can put it on their find a grave site. It would be nice if there would be some other source that the city could use, which would be the Northampton Historic Site, that someone would come and say, okay, I'm interested in the Draper House. What can you tell me about the Draper House? Where is it? Who lived in it? What happened to them? And I know every one of you here knows which house I'm talking about, but I bet you don't know it's the Draper House. Ah, blank stairs. You know that big, beautiful Queen Anne right there on the corner of Bridge Street? John Draper, the gentleman who owned the Draper Hotel, built that house after his father passed away, and he inherited all the money. Um, but people don't know that. People would love to know about that house. Where do they go to find that information? Their interactive site would solve that problem. Northampton has lost properties. We just lost the Erastus Hopkins house. It's gone. It's not there. Anyone doing research on Erastus Hopkins has nothing physical at which to look any longer. That house could be on the historic Northampton site. I don't know how many of you remember the Parsons house that was on South Street. Do any of you know what happened? to the Parsons house that was on South Street. It got Ooh. torn down. It got moved to New Hampshire. Do you know where it is now? Williamsburg, yes. Williamsburg. It's on Village Hill in Williamsburg. We could put the picture of that rebuilt house on the Northampton Historic Site, and people would again be able to see the Parsons house. And oh, by the way, if you ever get the chance, if he's in the right mood, if you go and knock, he'll give you a tour. He did a beautiful job. So obviously I'm in support very much of the project. And just on a side note, I would be involved in that project. And if you're looking at money, if Northampton Historic Society were to pay me for my services, it's $45 an hour and they can't afford me. So they're getting a real deal. They've got tons of money. We know it. <laughs> Incidentally, there are already, if you look at the page for the Shepherd House, <coughs> there are already links to the Find a Grave um, entries for three of the people who lived there that I put in the, the prototype. Other comments on this? Yeah. I'm Kim Graham. I'm a Parsons affiliate. Our Parsons family originated from the historic. I've been involved since I was a baby, and now I'm really involved. <laughs> so I'm on the board of the Parsons family and the sport as well. Um, I've got my association, actually, we've gotten them to match funds to do some of the repairs and stuff like that. And I'm getting the place I work at the Mullen Center to come in with a group of people to do some landscaping. So there's people out there that want to support this. and. This is a way to actually get things going. I think it's a good thing. Thank you. Other, other comments? Yeah. Yes, you can see. Oh. All right. Uh, my name is Kiki Smith. I'm president of the board, so you know exactly where my allegiance lies in this. Um, and I do want to endorse. Um, Nancy's statement about this being a significant part of our outreach to the city and um, 
and out partly a way to help us reach out for more membership because I heard that question and that is a high priority for me as president of the board. So it serves many purposes and I heartily encourage you to support us as you have and I, I can thank you too on behalf for your help. Any additional comments? I would like to say one thing, and that's, it's really frivolous. And that is, when you look at the slideshow, there is a plain slide with no words and a broken wall. Mouse around until you get to the play button. <laughs> that's it. Well. All right, the next uh, project to take public comment on would be the Broadbrook Greenway acquisition. All right, hearing none, uh, the Seth Thomas clock restoration. Any comment on that? Who's going to wind that thing once a week? I'm trying to get him to the put it on electricity. The mayor is going to wind it. The mayor. It's going to, we're, going to, we're going to put that in the <laughs> charter. We're going to do charter change and get it approved by the legislature. You know, truly, I bet it falls to. Oh, yes, right. It's called um, alternate other duties. <laughs> yes. Um, the next uh, and last item for public comment is the conservation fund. Right, hearing none, uh, we are now to the item on the agenda, which is review and approve contracts and MOU for projects funded in round two of 2014. Can you, um, the agenda didn't come through to me. Oh. I mean, what's, what is, uh, what's the rest of the night? Uh, that's, for their benefit. that's, yeah, that's it. So we're, we're at the end of the public comment section, and we have to review and approve con contracts and MOU for previously funded projects in 2014, and then we adjourn. Okay. So it's basic bookkeeping from here on out. Yeah. Okay. We will, for a year of <coughs> um, we will have another meeting. Um, which will be a presentation of the Lasky Park project and then public comment. So that public comment is not segregated for that project. So anyone else we you know in the community who would like to make a comment on any of these projects would be welcome at that meeting. Um, What's two, the date of that? It's two weeks. It's the 18th, Sarah, is that correct? Uh, two weeks from today, that, yes, that is the Yeah, evening. so the 18th. And then our consideration will probably begin that night and then two weeks from that date will be our sort of final night of consideration where we'll be um, discussing more with the members of the committee about how we're going to act. What's the last thing you made? It's, it's, last? We will get, that will be the last, so a month from now, four weeks from now, that's generally when the bulk of our discussion will go on about planning the city. So if you were interested in observing that deliberation, that would be in four weeks. In two weeks will be a session more along the lines of public comment. But we will also begin our deliberations on that night with, with time today. Where can we see the MOUs and contracts? They are posted on the city website as they, soon as, I don't know if they're on there now or where. They, they are not because yeah. they haven't been approved. So we have, once we approve them, they'll be posted. So um, after tonight, they'll be posted. Yeah, if you go to, if you go to the CPC website on your projects previously approved, then you'll find all the documents associated with those projects. <coughs> and these are for <coughs> our last round. Yes. What's that? The, the ones we're doing tonight are for the last round. May I, I make one comment, Donnie, while Nancy's still here? Um, oh, it no. just okay. continues to be I think, embarrassing to not have the computers work. And, and I, we talked about this on numerous times, and I appreciate all the work that we did in, in preparing a, uh, what seems like a very informative program. And, and this just happens all the time. And so, Sarah, I don't know if there's a way we can we appropriate money. I mean, is there, I, is there anything that we can do or say? Yeah. So during the meeting, I emailed the city's the department. We're currently we've got a director. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I think there's something in the wall that's not connected. But that has been going on for years. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I've been dead. And when I come down here with the IT mm -hmm. people, it always changes. Right. Always. Every single one. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm in this room for other kinds of meetings, but I don't see any other group that would be able to take responsibility for fixing it. So I think we might. Well, the, the workaround, um, the workaround would be, or the solution would be for us to purchase out of administrative funds, a project, and then bring it to the 
connected to Sarah's laptop. The cable, the DGA cable, would be four feet long and it would project onto the screen rather than the juice. The problem is, it doesn't matter how fancy that is and how fancy the laptop is if the cable system isn't working. And that we can't do unless I bring my ladder. Or Glenn brings his ladder and we climb up and plug the cable into the back of the projector. So, but it has, I mean, it's been, it's been an issue since I've been on this committee, which is 2009. And I don't know, maybe that we, since this is a repeated problem, that every time it happens, we have the chair of our committee send a letter to the mayor or hangover of the city council to say that our city government is not functioning in a very important way. Because otherwise, it's. Not well, I'll be speaking to the mayor tomorrow about a different matter, but I'll bring it up um, because it is. I mean, it, yeah. We had an issue with not being able to access the email. Okay. Yeah. And that was something that we had paid yeah. to extend oh, the wireless yeah. service, and it was you couldn't get to Gmail. Um, so because of the city's um, firewall, and that took about a year to resolve it. So it's really I appreciate it to be the speech to you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate yeah. that you're, you're talking to the mayor, but I would prefer to have something in writing on the record that so yeah. if we have repeat instances like this. Yeah. Well, it's a nice enough projector. If it's just a cable, put in a new cable. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. Do you have a I well, you No. I mean, when yeah. we, when we're, when we celebrate Cinco de Mayo, it's typical to think you all in and two days and two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and accidents happen. Um, um, which, which, may I say something which, about which, your new cable? Yeah. Which would lead to the I did telecommunications for 13 years. It will be That's cheaper great. for you to buy a projector than it will be to yank that cable. Oh, no, I, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 okay. That's why I'm saying my solution is to have an AV card like they have yeah. in the metro store. Yeah. And then I can take it home okay. so nobody in the city will break it. Right. Oh, no. I want it here for all the other meetings that it does. Oh, no. No, it's ours. No. It's ours. It's ours. It's ours. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work for planning we board. It doesn't no, work for activation parking. It doesn't the, work. The CPC funded the, the new laptop and then donated the previous CPC administrative laptop to the city so that it could be used for presentations. But of course, it can't because it's can I just say, Nancy, Sarah's already forwarded your presentation, so you can leave a short of it. We have it. Thank you. Thank you. Could I make a clarification on yes. one of the questions we had in our, our period? The Boston Bay Architects has met with us twice. The first meeting was after an initial walkthrough. They gave us a proposal. We accepted the proposal, hired them, and then they prepared um, a detailed proposal for the repair of the two staircases. And all of their costs for investigation were there by, they're, they're part of the first stage. So that the second stage is doesn't require any more consultancy work on their part. It's just the actual construction work on the staircases. So the budget, uh, there's a line item for $10,000 for BA consultants. Or is that already phase two? Plan? Well, that may, is that for the master plan? No, I think that's, that's for, stage three. That's phase two. Phase Those two. in the budget. Yeah. That's right. I, I didn't prepare the budget, so I. Yeah. 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 So the stage two, which is the staircase repairs, has DBA consultant fees of $10,500. Okay. All right. The question is that those 10500 are already paid for as part of that initial investigation, or is a portion of that? No, I think that's been paid for. I think that's part of our initial outlay of 30000 Okay. So you have a let, let, me, let me make sure of that, and I'll okay. send a, a detailed explanation to Sarah. So it's a ten thousand five hundred mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's in addition to the phase one thirty three thousand. Okay. All right. So Sarah, we have no way to check.
I have to try to I didn't, I didn't really change anything in the bottom because it just looks like they're moving after my sight down. So I can just summarize those. Okay. I'm sorry. What are we doing? We're doing MOU and contract. Please stay. Let's go in alphabetical order, I guess. So, Bridge Street, condition specific, where the grantee shall identify that the project was funded through the CPA and its written materials, and that's it. So again, I mean, 
Motion has been made. Yeah. Motion has been made and seconded. But, but again, it's up to the committee. If no one wishes to make a motion or we wish to vote against these because we don't have the information, that's perfectly, again, that can still be unhappy, but we don't have to do something if we don't feel it's proper. So. But I, this, this is exactly what I said out of anybody did. Um, all in favor? Okay, again, the motion passes. We'll find it not take the vote. Uh, the next one. Uh, Jackson Street School Playground. So the only specific condition I had that I took from our discussion okay. was that playground development shall include provisions to limit any parking impacts to adjacent neighborhood. Didn't, didn't that one of those that we said pay for by CDC funds? Didn't did we? What do you mean? What do you mean? Didn't we have a, a sign required? Of, no. No. Yeah, stand for everything. Is that, is that a condition? Is that? A is that elsewhere in the contracts? Well, that is one that we need to add as yeah. is appropriate for. So we need to come up with an additional condition as to what kind of sign we would like. Is that not appropriate for the? Uh, no, I think the historical side of property as well. Yes, it would be. What's the first thing we go on? Uh, we go on some mm -hmm. So, in that one, so in that one, I wrote prior to the final payment, the grantee shall install a permanent plaque. So I stole the wording from the um, that the New South Street. Right. That's for historical Hampton. Yes. There should have a good street as well. What would you like? Yeah, yeah. It, it otherwise is assumed to be a school I, property, you know, a school project. Right, right. So, do we want a permanent sign or just a banner to propose? I think a permanent sign would be fine. Every playground in Look Park has a sign recognizing the donors that made it possible, so. I don't think it's unreasonable since, as you said, it is it's on school property, but it's supposed to be a community playground and funded by it. Yeah. 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 long in the future, it might remind somebody that, you know, yeah. is a neighborhood exactly. park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When people start to see the signs, so, you know, it just goes so much further with, yeah. there's money, everyone's yeah. money. Can I just ask, when, when we put in a condition like have to do something to mitigate the parking issue, I mean, that's a long-standing Jackson Street School problem. Like, I just don't know this part of my learning curve. Well, are we expecting them to tell us what they're going to do? I mean, we've had police posted there. I mean, it's it's a neighborhood problem with the school that parents are wanting to park on side streets to drop their kids off. Well, so that was in the discussion of this project. Um, it, it was brought up about potential parking impacts, but then the next part of the discussion was that the the impacts are not around, they're not around playground. the playground, they're around the drop-off. Um, that issue has come up repeatedly in transportation of yeah. Yeah. So which I is mean, where it belongs. So. so the idea was that, however, is that if the construction of the playground led to that impact, then there's some record of their okay. being responsible. In this case, it would be the school department, which the school department has issues like a JFK, where people were coming through residence to get through the, to the emergency right. exit, you know, and they would put cones across it to stop it from happening. So at least the, you know, we have a record that the school department had committed to dealing with the problem if it increased okay. the, the player. Next question. Yes. We're working off the current, the newly approved yes. of the contracts, and I assume those provisions are now also being extended into our town city agreements? Yeah. I don't even have a template to work on them. Because there's some provisions in contracts that are completely inappropriate for MREO. So I, I use the same template. So we also have language in our contract that address some of these conditions. So I think we worked on defining you know, the for, <coughs> for, for signage, I think we had some standard language about placement of permanent signs. You know, place mutually agreeable to the applicant and 
if you see it, so they couldn't stick it in the middle of the tulip garden. Permanent yeah. signage? We did about the banner we did, but not, the, not anything permanent, because it's sort of dependent on project. So for Jackson Street, I, I threw in, prior to the final payment, the grantee shall install a permanent plaque, the wearing of which shall be mutually agreeable to the grantor and grantee, acknowledging the use of two to eight months. Right, but I thought we changed it down these so that it would also be the placement of it, not just the language of it. Yes, but we also left it to be determined. So we need to do that for each We need to do that for each project. We decide. Yes. Because we made the decision that stock language, it wasn't useful having stock language because then the stock language would just get stuck in and it wouldn't really work. So it was better to have a placeholder and say, you need to, as a committee, think about the language for each one. So it could I mean, be the wording and placement of which shall be mutually agreeable. That would be my preference, just to assure that they don't unilaterally decide to stick it in a space. The good news is I don't think anybody's done certainly many purpose to do that, so I have to kind of trust it and get it done in pretty much the right place. Well, I've heard of, overheard a number of applicants who said, oh, well, we have to do it, but we'll just stick it on the side of the building. New South Street is prominently displayed on the yeah. front, right? Well, a lot are, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of our future folks will be killed. So, so, Sarah, you included that language in the historic Northampton? I did. Okay, so I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, we have which projects are not appropriate for placement of a sign, a prominent sign in a, in a fashion and location mutually agreeable to the applicant. Northampton Lodging and Lumberyard. Yard. Oh, but again, it's mutually we're agreeable. We're not going to force them. We're not going to hang a big ugly sign in front of their historic clock. Um, but are there, are there, I mean, I would just, I would just consider this as a motion so that we can be satisfied that we take care of this. Other than the Lumberyard Northampton Lodging, the other projects, the Stork Northampton, the Jackson Street Playground, Pulaski Park, um, Ridge Street Cemetery, Seth Thomas Clock, Sawmill Hills, would it be appropriate to include the language that Sarah included, which was permanent recognition of CPA contribution to project completion. Final to pri prior to the final payment, the grantee shall install a permanent plaque, the wording of which and location of which shall be mutually agreeable to the grantor or grantee acknowledging the use of CPA funds. Plaque shall be provided by the grantee. Yeah, the last two parts were just for construction plans, right? For that round. I still want a plaque. $200,000 and we don't get a plaque? <laughs> <laughs> we can make all the plaques we want, but we're going to stick them on the Stick them on the plans. plans. Well, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that we're hoping as a committee that they, that we didn't invest $200,000 in a part that's not going anywhere. So. Right, but the end product, we have <coughs> Well, then we can say this shall be placed in Pulaski Park. And the park's there. We're not, building, we're not, you know, we're we having the point, park. point is, is that we don't need to attach it now. I mean, once we approve. The rest of the Why are you doing this? Because I've been up since three in the morning. Why are you doing this to me? Can't we just? I'm trying well, to be helpful. Come I'm back trying to be helpful. I'm trying to cut. To I'm, it's eight fifteen. You asked which ones would be okay. appropriate or not. So I'm, I'm going to leave it to you then. Typically for plans, you know, we wouldn't include that. Okay, so all of them except. So all of them except those three. Mm -hmm. Well, what about? Um, the uh, uh, Sawmill Hills. We have we have a plaque, or you can call it a sign. We always have a sign. It's Everybody, not that exact same language, but it's but it's it's in the permanent. It'll say Sawmill Hills. Nobody's ever going to enforce these contracts in any way. So no, I do. I won't. I won't pay people unless they show me their sign. So yes, so or they take down the plaque. For you. <laughs> so sorry, we're having a conversation. So people think that if we pay for plant that we don't want acknowledgement of our funds. We were paying for more than plans. We're leveraging state and federal money. We're, it's, it's a lot. I think there's a lot of uh, CPA funds are a big deal. So the more we can say, this is what your money's doing, this is what your money's doing, this is what your money's doing, and then 
maybe they'll look at the website to see well, what do you mean this will my money is doing? What, like what park? Uh, they do, but we're, the sign will need to go in the park. But let me ask you, if we didn't, let's say we gave them no money. Let's say this committee decided to give them no money. Entirely possible. Okay, and let's say that the, <laughs> let's say they went forward with the park grant and with city appropriations and slowly, slowly built that park out according to the plans. You're saying that we wouldn't want a plaque there. We want no recognition because we didn't give them the construction money. I mean, I just think it doesn't make any sense. And what if they don't go forward with the project and we have Pulaski Park that exists the way it currently works and we have a sign that says thanks. For your $2,000 <laughs> entitlement. I mean, I can see, I mean, in that case, I can see, yeah, maybe if the park goes forward, if you want to condition it that way. But we're back to your question. I think you do, at least in the contract language, you've got, here's we want a banner while something's being constructed. We have another sentence that says, you know, we want an acknowledgement on all of your outreach materials. And then this permanent sign is a separate thing. So, I mean, I, you know, when the sustainability plan, right, and not sustainability, the invasive species conservation fund study that we funded, right, do we say that we want a permanent sign for that? We say that we want the CPA to recognize an outreach material. Right, so but if, do we want a permanent plaque somewhere? acknowledge that we have an invasive species management plan. I get your point down, and I, I can see that being a possibility. Well, let's, let's, yeah, I was trying to accelerate the process, but I've only set us back. So let's take this project by project. Um, I believe that we should reconsider, I, we need a motion to amend our, or reconsider or amend our previous motion, uh, because we don't have any recognition language in, which was our, Jackson Street. In Jackson Street. And Bridge Street. When, when in the cemetery? Street? Well, again, we're not actually doing anything except paying for a study in Bridge Street. Oh. So. I forgot that that wasn't in Bridge Street School. Playground. Yeah, that's not Playground. That's still playground. Playground. Yeah, playground is done. <laughs> um, so is there a motion <laughs> as to Jackson Street School, the recognition language about the recognition? I, I would agree man, Jackson Street School to include uh, language about recognition of CPC code. Okay, in a second. Mutually, mutual fashion and mutually agreeable site. There's a motion and second. All in favor? Uh, okay, again, unanimous with Linda not participating. All right, the next one, Sarah, we've gone through Stork North Hampton. The Lumberyard. The Lumberyard, okay. So all the standard things I checked out that will be affordable housing restriction. I left a question as to whether we'd want any Signage. Um, affordable units shall meet the eligibility requirements for low and moderate income housing as defined in Chapter 40B, Section 20, and the definition of affordable housing is defined by Chapter 40R. Um, and then the long language about the affordability restriction. So, in a form, a affordable housing restriction in a form acceptable to the grantor in Ensuring that 54 units of housing shall be limited for 99 years to individuals at or below 60% of AMI shall be executed and recorded prior to the payment of any portion of the funds. The restriction can be part of the affordable housing restriction required by DHCD as affordable housing tax credits. This restriction shall be senior to any other mortgages or notes on the property. The tax credit regulatory agreement or affordable housing restriction required by DHCD as part of the tax credit program shall qualify for this restriction if the city is co-named and subordinate to DHCD. Which is the same language that we use for every project, just with different numbers. Is there a motion? That was the Lumberyard? Yes. And then we approved the Lumberyard project. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, and the unanimous with none not taking part. And the other condition that we had in the council order was regarding the meeting, because the meeting already happened, I think. See I didn't think it necessary, but what did uh, Hampton Lodging, same question about whether we want any permanent signage, and then the exact same language, except that it's 60% of the total units shall be uh, limited for 99 years to individuals and are below 60% of the Okay, so is there a 
motion on this, and again, it has been our past practice not to prominently post a permanent recognition for affordable housing projects, and so if we do not wish to do so, then we just go forward with the same conditions, except with different numbers as to the number of units that will be affordable. So is there a motion to move that to approve? Okay, is there a second? Second. Right, that okay, further discussion? All in favor? Okay, once again, unanimous one. Perfect. Next. Uh, next is Pomeroy Terrace National Register District. Uh, so the, there's no permanent sign here because there's. I mean, we could. I guess we could require that when the district is created, we include that on the sign. But it's just that the grantee shall identify that the project is funded through CPA and its written materials, including press releases and brochures. I move to approve, but I tend to agree with Sarah's first suggestion that I assume that if it's a national historic district, they're going to have a sign acknowledging that somewhere in the neighborhood, and that they should also have a one acknowledging our contribution. Along with it. Second. Second. All right. So this is a conditional. If if approved. And do we wish to have a second to the fashion and location? Yes, fashion and location. And typically, they would be located at the gateway to the district. So You're thinking that it's on the historic sign itself, not two separate signs. Well, that's not Are we right. also paying for that sign just because it's a? This is a pretty small project, and it will not be approved oh, yeah. over the term of the MOU. Yeah, typically we put the cost of the sign on that thing. Yeah. So, Zara, you were saying you thought this was the cost of our $500 brass black with a quarter of a $2,000 grant. So we 
required a conservation restriction held by a third party um, that shall be senior to any other mortgages or notes that shall be executed within six months after a purchase, except that it's not possible to execute. Uh, within three months of acquiring title to the property, a permanent sign shall be installed on the property in a mutually agreeable location credit with the CPA. And then typically for, um, for open space acquisitions, we re require that the Conservation Commission sponsor a zoning change to rezone the parcel as farms, forests, and rivers, which is the city's most restrictive zone. Have we done that before? Yeah. That sounds like a new language, no? Uh, it was included in the last two. Okay. All right, is there a motion? Yes. Okay. Is there a second to the motion to approve the contract? Yes. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Last one is the clock. Uh, so I, we didn't require a sign since it was for acquisition. Um, and then the other two I just listed from the council order. The clock shall be stored in an appropriate weather safe location that will preserve and secure it until it is restored. Uh, it shall ultimately be installed at a highly visible public downtown location at which point a permanent historic preservation restriction will be created. And the clock for any of its components shall not be disposed of the city council approval. Okay, is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a second? Second. 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 Okay. I, I would like to add in the signage. I I want I want the signage to replace <laughs> the ground. Yeah. <laughs> to replace the name of the clothing store that originally installed the clock. Yeah. I think it should just say Rothstein. No. Community <laughs> Preservation Act. No, it's going to be All right. So, um, I mean, there's going to be a kind. We want a little CPA, the black In this case, we could probably move it up to the applicant. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to force him to do it if you're looking at the. Integrity of the clock. No, I was just saying on it's gonna have a no, yeah, concrete base and be a little tasteful. Pretty tasteful. But tasteful. Alright. Um trying to define tasteful is like a good thing. So there's no strong consensus for permanent damage. Or do we wish just to say mutually mutually agreeable allows us to say at the end of the day, yeah, we agree with you that it's not working. We can add that same oh, language. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion? We already have the motion. That's one I just wrung out of you. Yeah. Are, are we paying? So motion and seconded. Point? All in favor of this one? Hold on, Sarah's got a question. Are we, are we paying for the point? No. No. Okay. All right. They, they made our overhead projector work. We're paying for the side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see somebody. <laughs> You're ready, Brian. All right, um, that is it. Motion to adjourn is a motion. No, I have a. No, I would like no, to. No, it's not debatable. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm adding one more agenda. Can't yeah. do it. Open meeting long. Well, the closed meeting. We adjourn. Well, we have Did adjourn. anyone yeah. see the. Um, oh, what's the Western Mass magazine? The uh, preview, uh, whatever it's called. Our own day. This is what I was thinking of Rothstein. Whatever. They <laughs> should <laughs> prominently.